Starting and we're live. Um, let's see if we have anyone who joined yet. No one yet. Let's maybe huh. give people a few minutes. Man, this is the drink of the day right here. What is that? Oh, I, I've been drinking uh, these double shots all day long. Which ones? Sorry. The, the Starbucks ones. I've been drinking these, and then I bought an espresso machine, and that just got delivered today. Oh, so nice. dangerous. Nice. You're <laughs> not going to sleep now at all, then? Uh, never again. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you know, you know what I like? The little uh, – I'm too cheap for this, uh, an expensive espresso machine, so those little, like, kettles, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Like, they're <laughs> little – there's water in the bottom – Water in the bottom. I don't know what that is. Like you, it's like a little Italian like thing. You put like, oh, water in the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I used to have one of those. Um, so you're talking about they're like kind of like silver looking, and it's kind of like an old fashioned espresso machine. And you put it on your stove, and it will cook it, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I used I had one of those years ago, and uh, here's an interesting uh, fact: don't put uh, bleach in it because it actually causes a chemical reaction, and what happens is like a chemical comes off of it. It's it's deadly. I ruined a pot by doing that. Now the funny thing is I can't find them. Oh, did you? I think it went frozen. Go oh, frozen. Well, I can hear you. Vasily went frozen. Yep. He... There he is. Hey. All right. Holding, it looked like you were holding that face for a bit. <laughs> I think uh, the hangout froze on you. That's what I thought. Yeah. Let me see if all my stuff's still running. I had a little surprise because um, there's a, there's something I have to run on my machine to demo, and it synchronizes with the network, and it takes a while for it to synchronize in it. Uh, so you got to – sometimes it takes days to catch up. Days uh, to catch up. Yeah, it downloads like the whole database, like the whole network, and it's and stuff is continuously put into it. So it depends right. on your bandwidth, mm -hmm. how fast your machine is, your hard drive, and um, is it running now? Because maybe yeah. that's why you froze. Can you stop it? <laughs> because that's not going to be good if you're presenting and it freezes. I hope that was the VPN. So I shut that off. All so right. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> All right. Well, we got a few people. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? People will just continue joining uh, as we move along. So welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the sixth and last Los Angeles uh, user group. Uh, this is a virtual LA user group. <laughs> uh, Pre-holiday or hol I guess it is. We are in the holidays, right? So Yeah, we are. But we're working. <laughs> Holiday season um, user group. Man, I still need to buy presents for people. Are you guys done yet? With presents? Now, I'm waiting for you to give me mine and not buy yours. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. See, <laughs> I need to go buy presents. Yeah. I need, to, I need to actually, I need to make a list. I'm so behind. I'm so you screwed. You should check it twice. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited, though. I mean, it's, it's yeah, going to um, be a good one. You know, I, I never really cared about Christmas until I met my wife. And she uh, she's the one who put the Christmas bug in me. Now I love it. It's one of my favorite holidays. It's the best. Yeah, I think that was a, her plan all along so she can get presents. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> yep. All right. So, well, anyways, welcome, everyone. Um, so today we have... Uh, Three presentations uh, for you guys. So we'll start off uh, with uh, mine. And uh, uh, for the folks who join, my name is Vasily, um, Psycho MVP. Actually, we have three MVPs, so including me. So uh, I'll be presenting first, and then Mike. Everybody knows Mike. I don't need to introduce Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I, if, if you don't know Mike, you're in. I'm Santa Claus. <laughs> you can't say you're in the psycho space if you don't know Mike. Um, so Mike uh, will be talking about web forms or forms web forms. or the experience, lack of experience forms. <laughs> experience forms. That's right. That's right. It's all about experience. And we got Shrikanth, uh, our commerce MVP, who will talk to us about minions. 
little one eye, little funny guys that run <laughs> in the background. <laughs> you know, every every time we're at a client, because I, I deal a lot with commerce, right? So every time we're at a client uh, and, and we talk about commerce and we talk about integrations and we, of course, meetings come up, every time there's just at least one, and everyone tries to keep it serious, right? So we're <clears throat> a serious discussion, we're discussing the infrastructure, then, you know, the design, and there's always just one person just chuckling after so after someone brings up minions and that person just chuckles the whole time <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> awesome all right cool so i'll go ahead and get going uh, uh today i will talk to you guys about blockchain let me see if i can share the presentation okay let me get this going <laughs> Okay, and let me try to share my screen. And let me know if you guys can see it. You guys see it? I can see it. Okay, awesome. Uh, before I get going, um, guys, uh, please uh, tweet whatever questions you have to us, uh, hashtag um, S uh, SUG. Uh, Cycle user group or hashtag LASUG, Los Angeles user group. Um, hashtag both <laughs> three times if you want your questions answered first. Um, uh, so uh, at the end of each presentation, we'll check uh, social channels, we'll check the chat, and uh, uh, we'll try to answer your questions. Uh, if we can't, we'll follow up later. All right, so let's get going. Blockchain. All right, so this is an exciting topic for me. I've been uh, uh, in the blockchain space for for a while now, and uh, I mean, really, if you have a uh, or if you had a TV, um, if you watched news last year, if you had a TV last year, you you also heard about blockchain, right? About this time of last year, it exploded. Everyone was talking about it. There's a lot of hype, um, a lot of uh, uh, magical properties we're given to blockchain. It was supposed to answer all of our questions, solve all of our problems. It has magical properties and it cures cancer and so forth and so on. Unfortunately, that didn't turn out to be the case, obviously. Um, and uh, there's a reason for that. So we'll talk about the blockchain, what it is. Uh, we'll take an objective perspective at what the blockchain is, what it really can and cannot do. It, well, we know it can't cure cancer now. Uh, but we'll look at what it can do and what the real world use cases are and uh, talk about some of the companies that use it and talk about uh, how it can be used with Cycro Commerce. Uh, I'll show you guys a few demos of some of the things that I've implemented. We'll go over the code. If we have time, we'll uh, look at each uh, repository. I have a few pieces up on GitHub and uh, show you how to use them as well. So let's get started. The blockchain. So we'll talk about what it is. Like I said, we'll uh, take a quick look at the history of blockchain, uh, where it came from, what it is. Um, quick look at where it's going. Take a look at uh, what Bitcoin is. Everyone's heard about Bitcoin, right? But not many people really know what Bitcoin is, what the Bitcoin uh, protocol is, the Bitcoin network, two different things. Uh, Ethereum. Same thing, we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about how blockchain can be used in e-commerce space, like I mentioned. And these are the four uh, real world kind of applications that we've identified um, with the help of uh, 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 Harvard Business Review Journal um, that are uh, affected or will be affected the areas of the e-commerce that will be affected by the blockchain and we've uh, developed demos uh, for you guys so blockchain identity royalty rewards digital rights ownership we'll touch a little bit on tokenomics um, uh, the new business model that got introduced by the blockchain but that's a whole different topic of its own so we'll just briefly touch on that all right so why do you even care about the blockchain right <clears throat> So before reading the slide, let me go ahead and bring up this page right here. Very useful, very useful page that lists interesting uh, facts about the blockchain. So let's go ahead and scroll down. So here, let's see, was invented in 2008. It was invented by Satoshi Nakamoto. 
We'll talk about them here in a minute. Uh, projected market cap by 2020, $60 billion. That's huge. Um, blockchain's reported potential for reducing bank infrastructure costs, 30%. Isn't that great? 30%. You, banks will save 30% by um, uh, implementing blockchain solutions. Uh, let's see. There was another one. Average investment in blockchain projects, $1 million. We'll talk about the projects as well what those are and what ICOs are. And this, this is a, this is a good one. Uh, percentage of banks that are experimenting with permission blockchain. So permission blockchain um, is one of the types of blockchain. We'll uh, talk about what that is in more detail here, but 69% guys, 69% of all banks are experimenting with the blockchain. So it has to count for something, right? Uh, so it's you know it's coming you know uh, we know it's coming uh, we know it's real we're now starting to take an objective look at it if you're familiar with um, the technology the invention um, uh, uh, market hype curve um, there's a name for it I'm um, I can't think of it right now there's a curve that goes rapidly up that's what we saw last year and then it drops back down. Uh, and we're probably approaching close to the bottom where people start realizing um, what blockchain is, starting to take an objective look at it, trying to apply it to real world scenarios. We're at the top of that hype curve. Everyone was excited about it. Uh, it was kind of a situation where if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail type of thing. So people were throwing blockchain around uh, everywhere. Uh, it could stick. There was a tea company, I believe, that uh, added the just by adding the word blockchain to the company name without really changing a business model or really anything in the recipe of the tea, uh, tripled its stock in the, in the stock market just by adding blockchain to the company name. So people were uh, throwing it around left and right. Uh, everyone was trying to make money on it. But now that the hype is down, people are starting to realize uh, for what it is. Uh, now we're taking an objective look, right? So what is the blockchain? It's a decentralized storage and uh, uh, availability network. Uh, it's a network of nodes. And I have a node running on my local machine that I'll show you uh, that synchronize with each other constantly. Every single node stores a copy of the database, of the blockchain database. It's a, a ledger of records. Um, essentially, that's what it is. And every single node on the network uh, synchronizes with the rest of the nodes on the network. Um, every node has to be in sync. Uh, there's validation, verification that happens behind the scenes. But essentially, it is a decentralized storage and uh, uh, availability network. Um, and decentralization of the network is what brings blockchain the power. Right? And it also brings one of the biggest problems that blockchain uh, is dealing with right now is scalability. I'll touch on that in a little bit. Security. Uh, once a block of data has been saved on the blockchain, it's immutable. That is uh, true for Bitcoin. It's true for Ethereum. Uh, it's true for uh, transaction data. It's true for smart contracts. That's why they're so valuable. Once you've created that contract and saved it on the network, you cannot modify that contract. I mean, you can kill that contract. You can write rules uh, for self-modification, but that's all available. Um, in the contract and it's open to public. So uh, there's nothing that can go behind the scenes that all of a sudden uh, could modify the outcome of um, the smart contract code, for instance. All execution is deterministic. Uh, so the contracts, once they're put in on the network, cannot be uh, changed. You have to create another contract if you want to make a change to that. Traceability and audit. So the fact that they're immutable creates a great opportunity for traceability and uh, use of blockchain for audit purposes, trans whether it's transactions uh, in the financial space, um, payments, uh, really any ledger of uh, activity, right? Uh, it's very expensive to use it for regular logging right now, of course. But uh, if you think about some of the uh, uh, strictly regulated industries, uh, banks, financial institutions, government, uh, hospitals, um, storing identity online. That's another case, um, though, I mean, uh, an activity that happens to your identity. Uh, those are perhaps some of the things that can be done at this point. In fact, there are projects right now that are trying to do that. Value transfer, so Bitcoin, we talked about that. Microtransactions, um, micro, so blockchain, 
made value transfer very easy and very cheap. Um, like the uh, CEO of uh, Ripple was uh, saying at the, um, one of the interviews, the easiest way to transfer, let's say $50,000 to someone is to literally go to the bank, uh, pull that money out, put it in the suitcase, get on the plane, fly over and hand that money over. That is the fastest, easiest way to transfer money right now. Um, that those large amounts of money, unfortunately. Now with the blockchain is super easy. Uh, depending on the network of choice, it could be done in split seconds and the fees vary from free to you know a few dollars depending on the network, the load, the speed, the transaction priority. But essentially this opens up the opportunity for microtransactions where we can now transfer uh, instead of uh, only large amounts, we can transfer uh, very small amounts like cents. We can transfer a, a cent to a person for a unit of work, for instance. So think about the opportunities that, that it introduces. Uh, first thing that comes to mind is, let's say you're a developer and you're building uh, a piece of code against a unit test. Once you built that code, you submit that, unit test runs, verifies it, uh, it passes. Once it passes, it calls a smart contract on the network, which transfers you um, uh, money immediately for submitting that piece of code. So that introduces, that's just one example, but if you think about different industries, that opens up a whole world of possibilities. Reduce fraud. It's immutable, right? Uh, tokenomics. Now this is an interesting, um, uh, business model that got introduced by blockchain. Uh, tra in traditional startups, uh, usually, uh, what happens is there's, you know, the first stage is uh, uh, capital investment um, gathering. So you're finding investors or you're finding other people to start business with. If you need some startup capital, you find investors. If you don't need startup capital, if you need other types of resources that you don't have, you find other people. But essentially, once the team is up and running, the profit is made off of the margin, right? If you're providing services or if you're selling products, you're making money on that margin, whether you're charge, you know, it costs you less uh, uh, to uh, buy and resell if you're selling goods or if you're selling services, uh, you know, you're selling your services for more than what those services cost you, you know, more than what your time costs you. Uh, the business model that's introduced by tokenomics is a little different. Uh, it comes from scarcity and the limited supply. So you start off by creating a token and uh, your business, let's say um, the tokenomics Inc uh, only can, ex can only accept payments in the form of that token. And you set each token to be valued, let's say at a dollar. So you create a limited supply of tokens, let's say hundred tokens. You put 80% of that out in the market. You keep 20% of that in. Um, once you get 80% of users, uh, 80, the 81st customer comes in, it doesn't have enough tokens to use. So now since your service is still valued at a dollar, the price of each token has to go up, right? So essentially the price of each token inflates and therefore the value of the 20% of the tokens you left for yourself grows and then eventually you start selling off. Um, so that's the, in the nutshell, the tokenomics frame. Now, if you want to learn more about the blockchain, here is a great website, Blockchain Demo. Uh, this is perhaps one of the greatest, uh, um, best websites to learn how blockchain functions, how blocks are created, how they get verified. Uh, it walks you through different steps. It's an interactive uh, uh, animated uh, uh, website uh, that you can play around with and uh, really helps to wrap your head around uh, how blockchain uh, works, how blocks get verified, how the whole really picture comes together. So moving on. <clears throat> so we've talked about what kind of blockchain was. It's a secured ledger capable of storing data and running operations, right? So um, Digit is the most important invention since the internet itself. Uh, uh, well, Digit, the blockchain, uh, that is a misspelling. So the blockchain is the most uh, important invention since the internet itself, founder of Netscape. Uh, some compare the effect of uh, what blockchain is going to have on our daily lives to the invention of the internet, and some say it might be more impactful. Um, there are four stages, I believe, the Harvard Business School identified for uh, integration of blockchain, and this technology is not going to take over anytime soon. It will probably take 
five, maybe 10 years for it to really settle in um, and start being used and more uh, for other phases uh, to come in. The first phase is uh, ad hoc transactions, some of the things that we see with Bitcoin. Um, and then uh, the second stage, I believe internal businesses internally starting to use it. So this is where we now see 69% of banks starting to use blockchain internally. Uh, then uh, the third phase is integration with external businesses. And the fourth phase, if I remember correctly, um, all phases of uh, business infrastructure get up on the blockchain or something like that. So it takes it's going to take quite a long time for, for the blockchain to take over, but it will impact every aspect of our daily lives. Um, that is true. I'm not going to go into um, why and how you, can, you guys can read up yourself or just you know, ask your questions or ping me after the presentation. <laughs> All right. Um, so quickly on history of the blockchain. So 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto releases a Bitcoin white paper. Uh, who's Satoshi Nakamoto? No one knows. Still, to this date, uh, there are literally legend and sagas about this guy. Uh, and no one really knows if it's a person either. So it could be a group of people that created the white paper. Uh, it could be a person. There were a couple people try to impersonate. Uh, Satoshi came out saying that, um, you know, they are, they were that, you know, person. But uh, obviously, obviously they got uncovered. Uh, but still to this day, no one really knows who Satoshi is. But whoever he is, or they are, they published a white paper describing the blockchain, uh, blockchain uh, and the Bitcoin protocol in 2008. 2009, the first Bitcoin block was mined. And those uh, the, uh, blocks on uh, the first blocks on the blockchain are called Genesis blocks. 2010, two pizzas were bought with 10,000 Bitcoin. Guys, 10,000 Bitcoin, someone paid for two pizzas. Right now, the Bitcoin is down probably about $3,000, but I'm, it was at $20,000, I think, about this time last year, uh, or peaked at $20,000. So uh, I wonder how that person feels now, <laughs> looking back at it. Um, 2011, Bitcoin is used on Silk Road. Silk Road, uh, if uh, uh, you don't know, is a black market website for all kinds of bad things. Illegal things start from drugs to uh, murders. You know, there are all kinds of bad stuff going on on that. And of course, uh, with Bitcoin being a secure value transfer uh, protocol, it was a great way for someone to offload money to launder money uh, or pay for, you know, things that shouldn't be publicized, uh, such, as, such as things on the Silk Road uh, with uh, Bitcoin. Uh, because it doesn't go through financial institutions, it doesn't get audited, it doesn't get the Homeland Security isn't looking at it, it wasn't regulated at that point, no one really cared about Bitcoin at that point. So uh, Silk Road was uh, an ideal place for Bitcoin at that point in time. Uh, Litecoin was released. Uh, Litecoin is a lighter version of Bitcoin. So uh, a Bitcoin foundation split into two uh, camps. Uh, people that believe that certain change had to be made, people that believe that the uh, Bitcoin had to stay original. So anyways, the, the second groups, uh, the first group split into and created, split into a new project called Litecoin. You can read up on that later. Uh, and then Bitcoin starts growing, uh, it gains popularity. People start talking a little bit about blockchain around 2012, 13. It's more experimental, uh, more anecdotal. Uh, I remember hearing about it around 2012 and thinking, what in the hell is that fad, right? Um, not giving a dollar. So, but in 2012, it passes a hundred dollar mark. 13 passes a thousand dollar mark. 2015, launch of Ethereum. That is a, a new blockchain uh, launched by Vitalik. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the guy is either Russian or Ukrainian, I can't remember, but uh, the, his full name is Vitaly. Vitalik is kind of a, you know, the um, uh, uh, child, you know, kind of cutesy version of the Vitaly, the name, but he likes to be called that way for some reason. So it's an interesting fact. And then 2015 and now endless stream of new blockchains and projects. So you may have heard about ICOs, uh, initial coin offerings. Essentially, it's a, an effort to raise capital for an ICO project. Like I mentioned, that uh, blockchain is going to affect pretty much 
eventually all, all aspects of our daily lives. Um, it will take a while, but there are so many applications for it and people realize that and they start projects around building and integrating blockchain into different uh, industries, platforms, software applications, so forth. And uh, it's essentially, it's an effort to raise capital for a project, uh, an initial coin offering. Uh, it was a, it had a great run because it wasn't regulated by the SEC uh, for a while. Then SEC stepped in, finally started regulating it. So you start, you don't really see ICOs anymore. They, they call them initial token offerings now. So they took the let, uh, the word coin out of it, but it's you know same animal. But essentially there are two camps in the blockchain community if you start reading up about it. Um, it's the blockchain is all about Bitcoin or the blockchain is about technology. So I'm on the second camp, uh, technology. I think Bitcoin is great, but I think the technology is uh, it itself is, is going to have a much bigger impact on us than just the Bitcoin. So we'll talk about blockchain being decentralized and distributed. What does that even mean, right? So right now we're in the centralized camp uh, with a lot of our services. So if we think about banks, we think about, um, gosh, post offices, uh, networks, really uh, active directory, right? So we have a node, a centralized node uh, that uh, um, controls lighter nodes, right? So if we're talking about active directory, you have a, a domain controller. We're talking about a banking system, you have a banking branch, right? a uh, centralized bank. There's one place where everyone eventually goes to to do certain things, right? Whether it's uh, in the virtual world or in the physical world. And the reason why we have that is because of the lack of trust, right? We don't, uh, we, we don't trust ourselves to store our money, right? Be before banks, people used to store them under, uh, you know, bed mattresses or in all kinds of weird places and, uh, you know, from uh, trying to keep them, keep them away from people stealing them, right? So then we created banks. Banks uh, banks were safe deposit place for our finances. Uh, so again, that started because uh, the lack of trust. A lot of services started because of the lack of trust. And what's interesting is that the blockchain is founded on the lack of trust. So blockchain is decentralized for one. So there is not a single centralized place where all the data is stored. Um, it's stored in all of the nodes on the network, um, on the public blockchains. There are some variations to that. Uh, they're trying to uh, fix the scalability issue, but for the sake of simplicity in this presentation, we'll just touch on Bitcoin and Ethereum. So every single node on those networks that use proof of work, uh, every single one stores a full database of records. And uh, that would, uh, what's decentralized means and distributed, uh, meaning Every single node talks to every other node. So every node is uh, synchronizing with other nodes on the network constantly. Uh, and what that looks like is right here. Let me show you guys. Right now I'm running a uh, demo version uh, of, a, of an Ethereum test network called uh, Rinkaby. So this is a full featured uh, Ethereum node running on a test network. As you can see, these are transactions that are coming in. Um, not necessarily financial transactions. These could be smart contracts executing uh, programming code uh, or it could be value transfer happening on the network. But as you can see, these things start coming in. Sometimes they come in faster or slower. What I was saying in the beginning of the presentation, it took me a while to sync this. Um, if you uh, do want to build it on your machine and try to play around with it. I'm using a, uh, a client called Go Ethereum, uh, G-E-T-H, GETH for short. Very easy to install it. Uh, it really takes a minute to get going. You just download the GETH client, you start it up. Here is a command that you want to use. Um, so GETH, let me see if I can increase that font. So Geth, Rinkaby, that's the name of the network. It's an RPC host, um, RPC API. Mm -hmm. These are the modules that we're loading. We're loading networking web three. That's the protocol oh, or the, not the protocol framework. Um, uh, loading network uh, path where the database is stored. Uh, Ethereum, uh, where we'll accept requests from uh, all kinds of domains and this is uh, and all kinds of IPs. 
right? So this is uh, these last two are required if you want to call remotely. But essentially, run this command. It's going to start a, a, an Ethereum node. Now, it, will, it might take a long time, depending on the speed of your server, it might take a, a while for it to sync up. Uh, the way to connect to it is uh, once you have it up and running, you see transactions posting. By default, it's going to appear um, uh, on port 8545. So what you can do is open another window in DOS, do gif attach, and then uh, specify the endpoint. And that's how you can attach to an Ethereum node remotely. And it will connect you. Uh, and you can check the status of the syncing process. Uh, if the sync is in progress, as you can see up here, it'll tell you where you are on the current, what your current block is, what the latest block is. So it'll tell you how much behind you are. <clears throat> uh, and once you're caught up, it'll return false. So I'm all caught up on my synchronization here, which is good. If I weren't, I wouldn't be able to show you guys the demo. So that's what the uh, decentralized and distributed uh, network is. Right? OK, so what is Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin, gosh, it got so much hype uh, last year. I, I, everyone was talking about it. Uh, essentially, it's a decentralized distributed means of, of storing and transferring value, right? Uh, it's, uh, um, it's a network protocol. And uh, it is also a coin. Um, it carries the same name. One of them is spelled with a lower B. Can't remember which one, but uh, Bitcoin is both. Uh, it's a network, and uh, the uh, the gas uh, money, quote unquote, is is what's called in, in the blockchain space. What pays for transactions and what pays all the miners that uh, verify transactions. So essentially, it's a way to transfer value, right, from one person to the other. Uh, who gave Bitcoin value? We did. Um, because we think there is a lot of potential in it, because we think uh, that uh, uh, because of the limited supply, uh, in, in order for Bitcoin to be able to accommodate all the financial transactions that happen on a daily basis for mining transfers has to be of a, of a certain value. So there have to be so many dollars in one Bitcoin for it to account for all the uh, daily transfers, right? So that's where the value comes from. Uh, but it's kind of the same thing, right? What, what gave gold value? Right, same type of argument. So no one really did. We just think that it's useful. Um, yeah. uh, Bitcoin networks um, are huge. And it, the Bitcoin network has grown so much. Uh, check this out. Bitcoin network uh, has a computing power of uh, over 2 million units, uh, computing units per second compared to 274 same uh, types of units per second, computing power of the 500 most powerful supercomputers combined, and that is in the world. So you guys, I mean, 2 million compared to 274 of the most powerful supercomputers. That's how big the network is. And I think the energy cost of the uh, Bitcoin network is larger than some of the European countries, uh, uh, than the energy cost of uh, uh, several European countries combined. So it's huge. So why did we jump on Bitcoin? Initially, Bitcoin was fast. Now it's super slow. Uh, initially, Bitcoin was cheap. Now it's expensive. It, it is still secure uh, and it is still easy to use, but it is running into a lot of scalability issues. Uh, and that is uh, uh, the problem that a lot of the blockchains are trying to solve right now. You, there isn't really a good solution yet. The, um, projects, different various projects uh, try to come up with creative solutions trying to sacrifice some of the features that make blockchain what it is and make it popular uh, for the sake of performance and scalability. Uh, but there isn't a fix for scalability yet without sacrificing some of the features. So uh, different blockchains solve it differently, different projects. So um, there are uh, private, there are public blockchains, there are consortium blockchains. Uh, public, both Bitcoin and Ethereum are what considers public blockchain. What we looked at 69% of the banks uh, playing around with uh, were called permissioned blockchains. Those are either private or consortium. In fact, uh, there is a blockchain as a service, BAS, 
um, service offered by Azure. So you can, if you have Azure credits or if you've never registered on Azure, go ahead and uh, register. You get some um, uh, free credits, I believe, uh, with your registration. So play around with that blockchain. You can create some consorting blockchains. Essentially, it's a hybrid between private and, and public. Um, Retailers using Bitcoin, interesting. Stock, uh, Overstock, Expedia, Newegg, Microsoft. Microsoft actually used uh, um, <clears throat> its consortium network on um, Azure, I believe, uh, based on uh, Ethereum. Can't remember. Uh, for royalty payments for Xbox <laughs> game developers. So that was pretty cool. Uh, and like I said, there are plenty of scalability issues. So what is Ethereum? So while many call Bitcoin, um, a blockchain 1.0, uh, Ethereum is called blockchain 2.0. Now there's also 3.0 blockchain, uh, I forget what the name of the network is, but Ethereum essentially added the ability to store code on the block. So where Bitcoin was simply transferring debits, credits, so plus minus decimal, right, from uh, one account to the other, because uh, essentially Bitcoin, where your Bitcoin is, it's not, it's just a, a store of debits and credits. Um, while Bitcoin was simple that like that, Ethereum is a little more complex. Uh, so Vitalik had the ability to run code on top of that network. Uh, and so he split off, created his own uh, blockchain called Ethereum. And uh, so here are the areas where Ethereum uh, is going to make the biggest impact in the coming year. So supply chain. Uh, because the network is secure, um, uh, because it's immutable, uh, if we can integrate all aspects of the supply chain uh, industry uh, and put all that on the blockchain, we can ensure um, the the sourcing and the history and uh, uh, ensure the the integrity of the information and, and see exactly where each product is coming from, uh, how it was put together, things like that. So a lot of, lot of uh, potential in the supply chain uh, space. Identity ownership, that's a huge one, and I'll demo uh, that in, uh, here in a little bit. Identity ownership, storing your identity online. If you think about it, uh, your identity is already stored online. Um, there are some projects that try to uh, make it so we all get paid for our information being online every time it's used. So for instance, let's say a website wants to personalize uh, itself based on your information, right? Let's let's talk uh, in Sitecore terms. So uh, a user lands on a Sitecore website and Sitecore wants to know something about you on that first landing, right? As you first hit the website without having any prior interaction history with a site, I mean, the only option really you have right now is to hit a third-party ad network. Um, you know, that could potentially shed some light on the user. Uh, but it could be made so once a user uh, lands on the website, the website could ask uh, for the different types of information, for your personal information, and you could also get paid based on that information. Uh, you, and it could literally be just cents, you know, per page, uh, but with the possibility of doing microtransactions and with a security blockchain, it is possible. So there are projects that try to make it. Um, so we can store identity online. Uh, it's also a secure store for, let's say, medical information and for digital rights ownership. Um, right now, uh, it is um, actually a, quite a quite a problem, and I never really thought about that being being a problem until uh, you know blockchain came out and proposed a different way of looking at things. Let's say you purchase a song on iTunes. Right. What you do is you purchase the right to listen to the song. You purchase a digital right uh, to that song. But what happens if you go to Amazon? Uh, you find the same song, but you can't listen to it. Even though you have rights for to listen to that song, you really only have rights to listen to that song on iTunes, right? If you bought on iTunes and vice versa. So it's platform specific. So the blockchain can uh, allow us to take our uh, digital right ownership with our um, online identity on the blockchain. And essentially what happens is, let's say if you bought it on iTunes, you go to Amazon, that same song, boom, you got it. You can still play it and listen to it because you own the rights. The rights uh, travel to different websites with you. So very interesting way of looking at things. All right, um, microtransactions, we already talked about that. And smart contracts. So Ethereum calls um, its uh, so-called, you know, uh, um, 
blocks of code on the network, smart contracts. I mean, it started off as a simple contract, if A, then B, uh, and uh, using Solidity. Solidity is, is the language of choice on the Ethereum network. By the way, what a... Uh, <laughs> Um, what an interesting language as you start working with it. It kind of reminds me of JavaScript way back in the day. It's very rudimental, very basic. And you have to specify lengths of integers. So that's that's how basic it is. And um, uh, so essentially those are smart contracts. Smart contracts host your code. And uh, uh, these are the, the application smart contracts uh, that we'll see in the coming years. Uh, now, again, this all comes from business Harvard reviews and the other sources. I didn't make this up, but I do believe that this is true. So loyalties, loyalty payments, uh, rewards, you know, points that you get for spending uh, or buying uh, uh, products or services, right? Uh, royalty payments to authors. Right now, what happens is the problem uh, with royalty payments is, uh, let's say you create a uh, song, right? And then you go to uh, uh, music services like iTunes and Amazon and so forth and, and upload it there and, and then set the price and negotiate the contract and you get a certain fee every time someone buys a certain percentage of the, of the cost, right, of the margins when someone buys the rights to listen or own the song, right? Uh, what happens is since that amount is very small, you eventually get a check maybe at the end of the month, you know, depending on the contract with uh, uh, the amount with the cumulative amount. Well, with the help of um, uh, microtransactions, those payments can be made live. So if anyone listens or buys rights to your song, you can, whatever that is, it's cent, two cents, 10, five, 20 cents off of a song that you're making, you can get that money immediately in your wallet. Um, right away and uh, it's a win-win uh, with the blockchain and rights ownership and royalties so the uh, the listener would own the rights to the song and take them with her while the author will get paid immediately and we'll actually take a look at that here in, in our demo how that works so demos I think I'm a little behind but I'll run quick uh, blockchain identity so we'll take a look at what uh, um, uh, what it takes to create an identity on the blockchain uh, with Cycle Commerce. All this is integrated with Cycle and Cycle Commerce. Uh, we'll take a look at royalty payments. Uh, we'll take a look at what we talked about with rewards and loyalties, essentially getting a certain percentage um, of a transaction on your account. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, thing is with uh, tokens is that uh, since they're public, you can take those talk tokens with you um, to another website and use them to purchase products, right? Where, let's say right now, you can accumulate points on Expedia. Can't go anywhere and use them, right? You have to use them on Expedia. Digital rights ownership, we talked about that. Uh, and we'll look at how we can store digital assets and take them with us uh, and go to another website and uh, listen to the song that you purchased. So let's jump into the demo. I'm going to open a the SXA website. I hope it's still warm. So the SXA website, for those unfamiliar with Commerce, is a default website that comes with a Commerce installation right out of the box, starting with version 9. It is built on top of uh, the Sitecore SXA, uh, Sitecore Experience Accelerator. And if you don't know what Sitecore Experience Accelerator is, it's a, a library of Sitecore components uh, that allow you to build a lot of widgets. So, I mean, the, a lot of things that aren't super complex on the website without doing any development, essentially. There's a, uh, it, it's an accelerator. It increases the release time to market. There are a lot, lots of other things that it can help with, but that's in the nutshell. If you want to learn more, <laughs> uh, look it up on uh, on Google. It's it's definitely a, a very very cool project. Well, it definitely wasn't warmed up. Let's see. It's time Ready? for a coffee break. I know, right? I I don't think coffee works on me anymore. I think I'm maybe I'm, it'll work on your browser. <laughs> <laughs> it might. Jeez, Louise. All right. Let me check. Make sure. 
I'm running in high performance and not in battery safe here. Okay, yeah, yeah, looking good. All right, well, let's give it some time. <clears throat> While that's starting up, I... You know, I don't know any jokes? I... <laughs> 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 I haven't had enough of the this rock star. Um, uh, there uh, it is, and it's there, back. There we go. All right, so let's uh, imagine that you're a new user coming to the website, and you would like to register. So we're going to create a new account. So again, this is the website that comes out of the box. So I'll be very creative with my account. Okay, I'm gonna create an account. Now this will take a little bit of time probably again because it's not warmed up. While that's coming up, I'm going to launch a mobile app. There it is. So it's another app, the source code for this, uh, another, uh, it's a mobile app built for Android and iOS devices. Uh, that can allow you to view your balance on uh, the Ethernet network. Uh, the, uh, the balance of um, uh, Ethereum that you got paid, and we'll wrap this in a little story that we showed at the symposium. Shrikanth was actually uh, in that presentation here. So while this is loading, so this is de still deploying the code, I'm going to open up something else. Jeez, what's going on with my laptop? I had to decide to be slow, of course, at the wrong time. Let me shut off a bunch of things. Wait a minute. What's going on? Time out. Something is up with the network. Did you pay, oh, your, no. internet, pay your internet bill? I did. I think it did the same thing. <laughs> I think it did the same thing with that it did earlier today, just got stuck on me. So right, right. Window just gets stuck, and you think it's syncing, but it's not. All right, look. so I just restarted. So again, this is my blockchain. Uh, node, Ethereum node. As you can see, it started on port 8545. I'm going to exit and reattach. See, it is being very slow right now. Hold on, let's restart. Not the computer, but the <laughs> the command prompt. All right, come on. I even jumped off the VPN for this. Come on, you can do it. Let me run it as an admin. Maybe there's a weird access issue. All right. As soon as this starts going, we should be in good shape. There we go. OK. That looks promising. Okay, now I'm going to try to attach to it again. All right, we're importing. Okay, so it's importing blockchains segments. That's good, that's what we wanna see. 
All right, well, let's try this again. So we're, we should be back in business now. Let me rerun the application. While this is loading, I'm going to restart the website and we'll pretend that none of what we just saw happened. <laughs> what happened? I didn't see anything. No idea. Look how fast the website is. Who said that we had performance issues in SXA? <laughs> All right, let's try this again. So let's do BBB. Come. All right. What do you mean you stopped? Okay. All right. Now this is looking better. And I think our mobile app is coming around the corner too. Okay, so while the mobile app is loading, so the first uh, integration that we have uh, in this demo is with creating an online identity. So like I mentioned before, uh, blockchain can allow us to store our identity online uh, on the blockchain. And since it's a mutable, uh, it's a great place to store our records, our history, right? So no one can change that. Um, so this is what uh, this demo stems around. So right now I registered as a user on the SXA uh, CycroCommerce website. What that did is it connected, when I was registering, it connected to uh, my local node to the Ethereum test network. And using the information I entered, it created an online identity for me on the blockchain network. So uh, what I did is I created a custom block in the Cypher in the uh, commerce engine solution that connects to the network and creates a blockchain identity for me. If we go back into the business tools, uh, we should be able to see. when it loads a blockchain address for my user. So that is the address of the contract where all my information is going to be stored, where all my digital rights are going to be connected to, uh, my uh, ownerships, um, my royalties, my uh, rewards, and so forth. So that is my sort of identity, right? Uh, the virtual identity on the blockchain. And if someone wants to get access to it, I can implement a method on my identity contract and uh, charge for that information. Okay. All right, we're coming around. We're getting close. All right, let's take a look at customers. There's the BBB guy. There we go. So this is our blockchain contract uh, address. So all my information is going to be stored on this uh, Ethereum contract. Now what's really cool, Rinkaby, which is the test Ethereum network that I'm on, has a rinkaby.etherscan.io uh, website where you can go and verify that identity. You can ver verify that contract. Since Ethereum is a public network, everything stored on that network is uh, public domain. Of course, it's uh, encrypted, um, the information. But uh, as you can see, here's the transaction that created my online identity. This is the record of my identity uh, being created on the network. And any manipulation with uh, this of this with this contract. If someone wants to, let's say, get access, uh, read some data, or send a payment to this contract to me, uh, in other words, uh, or update information on the contract, all of these uh, transactions are going to be recorded on the blockchain. You're going to get a list of these here, and, and everyone can get really access to that information if they know your address. All right. So now that we create our blockchain contract, we can start making purchases on the website. Let's go back to our website. I'm going to log in as another account. 
that I have. Okay. This is another demo account. In the meantime, let's check on our mobile app. Okay, the emulator just loaded. Jeez. I was telling Trikant earlier, right before this presentation, it took me uh, somewhere around five, six minutes to publish one item. I thought that was a temporary oh. glitch. Oh. Yeah. I don't know what's going on with my machine. Mike, are you trying are you doing anything to my machine? <laughs> I would never do such a thing. <laughs> All right. Trust you. You shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I see. Okay. Getting. All right. Come on now. Oh, I see what's happening. So my mobile app was still pointing to our demo server for uh uh, connecting to the Ethereum network. And looks like someone brought that down. That's why it wasn't connecting. All right. Well, we'll leave that. I'm running out of time here. So now that I'm logged in as another user, uh, let's go ahead and try to purchase something. And uh, the story is such is where uh, back in the day where, let's say, I wanted to purchase a digital product. In this case, it's a game. Uh, I had to uh, make a payment to the website. The website would, of course, own or host, let's say, the file, the downloadable file, right? Or have the rights to that downloadable file. Essentially, I, I send the uh, money to the company that owns this website. And in return, that company releases the asset. And then eventually, sometime down the road, uh, the person that actually created this game gets paid and hopefully gets paid the right amount, you know, because that person, of course, has uh, no insight into what's going on internally, how much, you know, that person really paid for that game. Uh, they, you know, get the, the right amount uh, of royalties back from the company. Uh, there's a lot of kind of trust going on. Of course, there's reporting and verification, but it's, you know, of course, it's as good as the company selling this product wants it to be, right? So blockchain can add a little transparency. So in this case, let's go ahead and uh, let's see. Let's go buy this guy right here. It's a digital product for this game. Subscription, add it to cart. I'm gonna quickly run through the checkout. I'm not gonna really focus much on features of the checkout. All this stuff comes out of the box. You want to play around with this, install Psycho Commerce 9 or uh, higher. Okay. $32. All right. Validate. Validate. Oh, there we go. Um, and let's see, I'm going to turn some other things on to try to improve the speed of my machine. Okay, should, hopefully that makes it better. Always picks Canada for me. I wonder, wonder why, Canadian guys. It's it's an omen. You, you have to go there and move there. <laughs> It's because the because the commerce team is in Canada. <laughs> uh, all right, so now I'm going. I'm going to go ahead and confirm the order. Click. Now let's check this window. Notice things happening on the network. So when I hit um, create order, uh, there are a few things that are happening behind the scenes. First, what I'm well, uh, what one of the customizations is doing is it's uh, hitting a a royalty contract and a royalty contract stores a ledger of digital products that royalty contract is owned by the creator of that game 
So what I'm actually doing is I'm sending money directly to the creator of the game right here. And I'm sending uh, a certain amount of money that the website says that the game is worth. So the royalty contract uh, behind the scenes uh, receives the amount of money. It makes sure that it's enough to pay for that game. And then it releases a download token back to me through the website. And the website passes it on to me. So this happens behind the scene. And all this is uh, determined by the contract developed in Solidity on this blockchain. Now, the second thing that happens is uh, uh, we, um, uh, uh, we store, update our loyalty rewards balance on the account. So for this transaction, we're going to get a certain amount of uh, tokens on our account. And uh, let's see, tokens, loyalties, rewards, and uh, we're also updating our identity contract. We're storing the fact that we own the rights to this product on our identity on the blockchain. So next time, let's say if we go to another website, uh, if that website integrates with uh, this uh, Ethereum blockchain, we can uh, update, uh, insert our online uh, address, that contract that I showed you guys earlier. Uh, and it should, if the website is integrated, it'll allow us to download that game because we own the rights to it. So here's our order. It succeeded. Let's take a look at what happened behind the scenes here in Cycle Commerce. So let's go back into uh, customers, our GGG customer this time. So this is our I online identity contract. Now, this is our royalty or our loyalty or rewards point balance. So with every transaction, we're hitting a loyalty contract. Uh, that's what I mentioned earlier. This is a contract stored. It's a smart contract stored on Ethereum network, also developed in Solidity, uh, which uh, I believe applies roughly about 10%. There is a market exchange rate that comes into play here. So it's it's roughly 10%. So, you know, depending where the mood of the market is, you know, at any point in, um, in time. So uh, so this value is constant. So we have point, um, 0.09 Ethereum. Uh, it allows up to 18 decimal points. Uh, and that translates into almost $10. That's our loyalty balance. So we're publishing purchase products to the network. That means we are storing uh, every time we're uh, uh, buying a digital product, it is stored on uh, on our identity, and we have the rights uh, to download it. So let's see what uh, happens now on the website and how the website changes this time around. So let's go back into uh, that game that we just bought to the product detail page and see how that changed. Uh, is this the guy? I think that's the guy. Now notice I no longer have the add to car button. I have the download button. Well, what's interesting, I mean, it's easy to implement, of course, by reading the order history here. The difference is that we are not reading the order history. We're reading our online identity contract. And since there, our online identity contract says that we own rights uh, to this game, uh, it allows us to download it right away without uh, having, you know, uh, to pay for it again. And really, if another website, I could spin up another SXA site, and that's what we showed in this, uh, at the symposium demo. Uh, if I were to go into that SXA site, uh, because it integrates with a blockchain, and if I were to apply this contract to my user on that blockchain, I could create a completely separate account. Uh, but as long as I apply my online identity in, in the account portal to my account, it would also allow me to download that game. Um, completely different domain, different server, doesn't really matter. You're taking your rights with you. So this is pretty cool. And another thing that happened uh, behind the scenes, of course, is a royalty payment. So as I mentioned before, uh, blockchain allows us to uh, uh, do micropayments, micropayments on the network and uh, royalty payment. Gosh, I can't remember now, but I believe it's also around 10% uh, on uh, our website uh, that gets uh, paid out back to the author uh, of the game. So uh, when I uh, purchased um, uh, this uh, uh, this product, 
the a certain amount, like I said uh, earlier, uh, we we're hitting the royalty contract, and the royalty contract determines you know where the money goes and if it's enough to pay uh, for the game. So the money gets applied to uh, the author immediately. A certain amount can get sent back to this website uh, again based on the terms defined in the contract for uh, selling this game. So all transactions, all debits and credits are settled immediately. Um, live at runtime and the cost of transaction is uh very minimal I, it's not even a fraction of a cent on this network right now it's it's so small it's it's trivial so very cool and uh the mobile application is still loading unfortunately i'm gonna try to publish it again uh the mobile application allows us to view uh balance on our network and the idea behind this is that uh, uh, we should be able to, as an author, we would release a digital asset and we would use this mobile application, whether we're on an Android or an iOS phone. Say again, it's, it's taking a long time uh, to view our balance. And we can see balance increasing as people uh, make purchases on our website. So pretty cool, right? Uh, lots of things happening in the, uh, on the back end. So to wrap that up, so what we just saw again, right? Blockchain identity, we stored our identity online. Uh, identity online gets created when uh, you register on the, SX, on the SXA website. It also uh, gets created or updated when you update an account. There's uh, there are a couple types of integrations. Royalty micropayments, we're hitting a royalty smart contract on the Ethereum network. That contract determines if that's enough money to pay for the product and whether we can uh, release a download token to the user or not. Right, so an author decides that. So an author really could at any point go into the contract and update the price of the product. Um, then the website would grab that price and show it to the user. And then the user, you know, send that amount to the author directly, not to the website, to the author. That's a big difference. So everyone gets paid right away. Royalties and uh, uh, rewards and loyalties, we saw the points. Uh, every time we make a purchase, uh, we can define the terms of the rewards program in the smart contracts. And since Ethereum is a public network accepted in many places uh, as means of payment, you can actually take those points with your online identity, go to another e-com website. If it integrates with Ethereum, uh, you can apply your, uh, apply your blockchain identity, that contract address, and uh, you can use those tokens on that site as well. Uh, and digital rights ownership, so we stored the ownership of that digital product that we just bought on our online identity that we created. And uh, again, just like with rewards and loyalties, if you take that contract and apply it to another e-com site, uh, it'll allow you to um, uh, uh, get access to, the, uh, to that product if they uh, store it. So uh, I also built another interesting little plugin for Chrome that I'll show you guys that can be integrated with e-com websites. I mean, everything that you see here, all the integrations are proof of concept and kind of bare bones, but they're fundamental, foundational. Uh, there's absolutely no security if you start looking at the code. So don't be judging it. This is to help uh, lay the foundation for someone who's interested in this technology. And this is really, this is the, the, the beginning steps of building uh, something that will come maybe Five, 10 years from now, right? But this, uh, if someone wants to play around with this, um, they can get access to it right now. Uh, what I wanted to mention is a plugin. Uh, let's see. I'm way over time with my slow machine today, huh? Uh, just slightly. Mm, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. It's all good. So the, uh, the plugin that's also available on GitHub that I built that will allow you to apply your uh, blockchain identity. So it is my blockchain identity 1.0, uh, also proof concept. It's my first attempt at being uh, building a Chrome plugin. Uh, very cool, actually, pretty, uh, pretty easy to do if you know JavaScript. Uh, and uh, you essentially what you can do is uh, uh, check if the website supports uh, blockchain integration so as you can see it's disabled right now if i go to my sxa website let's see is everything against me today sxa well 
let's see. It's supposed to enable itself. That's what's supposed to happen. Um, what is it listening to? So there is uh, there, this plugin. What it allows you to do is store a. You're gonna have to trust me on this one. So. It, um, it, uh, it allows you to store your online identity contract and apply it to the website. So uh, if you come, let's say, to the registration page on the SXA website, it uh, bakes that into the markup. It doesn't really do anything. It's it more of an emulation of the application behind the scenes. It doesn't really call an endpoint, but you could potentially create an endpoint that this plugin would call uh, and apply your identity contract. So this is how you can take your identity with you to a different e-com site. And uh, so now let's take a look at the uh, repository. So all this, all the all the things that you just saw are on my GitHub page. SXC Ethereum. Uh, this is the repository uh, that stores the Sitecore part of the integration. That stores a, a digital download rendering that allows you that checks uh, the Ethereum network for your digital rights. And if the product you're looking at is in your digital rights store, it allows you to download it. Uh, uh, pretty simple integration with an Ethereum uh, network C Sharp library. Uh, it also um, has a custom personalization rule. Uh, that uh, also checks uh, 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 your purchase history on the blockchain on your identity contract and allows you to uh, personalize uh, the website experience based on that. So uh, I believe it's called if uh, logged in customer purchased current product. So if the customer purchased this product that, you, uh, that the customer is looking at, you can personalize, turn things on and off based on that customer. Uh, SXEC Ethereum plugin. So this is a commerce engine customization has a couple of projects, uh, one for the updated, um, uh, well, no, the, this guy has the updated proxy. So this this is the customization to the commerce engine uh, solution that does all the communication behind the scenes. So creating an online identity, calling the royalties and the loyalties contracts online on the blockchain, uh, settling payments, everything is done in commerce engine. So that code is stored here. Uh, mobile app that was way too slow tonight, is in mobile Ethereum balance, and I, I swear it works. Um, download it, just update the endpoint in the code, uh, in the uh, code there, and point it to your local. And this is the Chrome blockchain extension that also didn't collaborate today. So all these are public, available uh, for you guys to look at. Um, if you have any questions on that and how to use it, how to set that up, uh, let me know. Essentially, SXE Ethereum, all you do is you just publish it your Cycro solution. Uh, I can't remember if I have Unicorn serialize the rendering, but the code for the rendering is definitely in the, for the custom rule is definitely there. Uh, this guy, uh, CE plugin included in your commerce engine solution, just like any Cycro plugin. And uh, uh, make sure to include the JSON with a policy in your environment. When you load it, rebootstrap, publish, you should be good to go. Mobile Ethereum app, it's ready to roll, just run it. Um, should be good. You'll have to install Xamarin locally if you don't have that to get that running. And for Chrome, just uh, download it and uh, include it in your extensions uh, in the developer mode. Um, this is not an officially published extension. So you have to enable the developer mode to do that. All right, I think I'm done. Uh, so thanks everyone for listening. Uh, so this is my contact information if you guys have questions. Uh, please reach out to me. I'm always happy to help uh, talk about blockchain, artificial intelligence. Uh, those things excite me. Uh, so uh, I can talk for hours about it. As you can tell, we're over time. Um, so Vasily Fomachev on, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, same as bestpractices.com. Um, I am actually thinking of uh, resurrecting uh, the uh, Friday Best Practices. So look out for more videos uh, in the coming new year. All right. Cool. I'm excited. Oh yeah, there's. Uh, I've been building up a library of ideas. Nice. <laughs> been been kind of busy too. Yeah, of course. Life happens. Let's see. Well, let me stop sharing. Ooh. It oh, it's nice and dark in your your room. It is. Yeah. Let me. Were you watching? Turn that up. Were you watching a movie? <laughs> uh, I need to turn the light off. I thought the camera would. 
pick that up. But uh, let me see if I have any questions online. Let me check Twitter. Have you guys been keeping an eye out? Uh, I've been bad at that. I've been doing something else, but uh, in watching your thing. Uh, Let's see. Actually, there wasn't any activity there. I heard that there was some confusion with the time. So that was the last note I saw. Ah, uh, okay. A time on the user group starting or a time on something else? No. So someone responded to Wesley's post saying that uh, the YouTube feed is saying that it's at 5 p.m. Oh, really? Oh, well, uh, that's fine. They'll catch up. <laughs> no, all this, stay tuned. Yeah. All, I mean, all this is uh, going to stay on, uh, on YouTube. It, it is a recording. Uh, so they can catch up later. They'll just be late to the game. That's all. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so you, you have time to edit out some of that stuff. I don't. I just gets published to YouTube right away. I mean, you, you can. I, you know, I wasn't serious. <laughs> I'm never serious. You should know me by now. I've had some short nights, so I'm a little slow. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. It's, uh, it's almost time for the holidays. Take time off. Sleep, please. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, uh, I don't see any questions, uh, and looks like that's. What I was wondering why we only have so few users. Ah, joining us. All right. So uh, that is for the, uh, that's it for the blockchain. Uh, thanks for uh, sticking around for <coughs> gosh an hour and twenty minutes almost. Wow. Um, yikes. Uh, well, uh, next up is Mike. Mike is going to talk to us about right. Cypher Experience forms. Um, All right. I should call my thing experience blockchain. Yeah, well, you have to in order to make it official. <laughs> Seriously. If it doesn't have the experience or an X, it's not official. That, yeah. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rename my uh, repositories now. <laughs> it's a good idea. Can you, can you, can you huh? see my screen? Uh, yep. And, see a slide deck? Yes. And see Jeremy. Make. Uh, you make sure that it doesn't take over because the mic takes over the screen when you start talking. Uh, I made it so we can see your screen. Uh, right. Permanently not. Okay. Go ahead and take it off. Uh, kick it off. Take it All away. right. So I am here to talk about Cycle Experience Forms. Uh, it's a presentation that I typically give with uh, my buddy Cam, but I'll get to that slide in a minute. But Anyway, it's just a couple of community announcements. If you're not in the Psycho community Slack, you really should be. Uh, here's a link to send a request, and one of our us admins will field that request and send you a link to get on it. This is there are at least well almost 4,500 members on here actively well not at the same time but actively sharing information with each other, answering questions, and having a laugh. You know, work shouldn't be stuffy during the day, so why not get on there and help other people out? Ian, laugh at. Giphy. Also, uh, because we don't really have much of a uh, persistent uh, archive of things that are on the Slack, if you want something more persistent that you can look it up later, forever, you can go to the Slack or Stack Exchange. Uh, really, we need your help. Uh, the community has been jumping on there and helping each other out, but this is a great resource to find out other information if you need some help, or you can jump in and help other people. Who am I? I am I'm Mike Reynolds. I'm the guy that's known as a psycho junkie in the community. I've uh, been called a few other things, psycho wizard, whatever. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, here's my Twitter. But the best place to get me is on Slack because I'm always on there doing admin -y things or trying to help other people or just making you laugh. And here's my blog. I do blog every once in a while. But um, my focus really has been on presentations as of late. But I'm also the guy known by lots of images and emojis and other things. So if you see these, this is probably a reference to me. Um, it's all there just to <laughs> make you laugh or whatever. But really, uh, so as I was saying before, I give this presentation with Psycho MVP, Kim Ruse Jermon, but unfortunately he can't be here tonight because he's saving the world uh, in Canada by eating one poutine at a time and doing Coveo things. So... In his absence, I will speak on his behalf. Uh, I know he actually presented at this user group at the beginning of the year, but um, 
I basically will have to field this without him. And anyways, let's jump to the other slide deck because I have two. I just like that using that slide deck to kind of troll him a bit because that's <laughs> what we do with each other. <clears throat> anyways, so now we're going to talk about Psychor experience forms uh, with 9.1 more experience. So I'm going to call out the bits that are new to 9.1, but unfortunately I don't have a demo on 9.1. I don't have it spun up on this machine, but I do have some screenshots, and I will. I can talk about some things. Not a lot is there that's radically different, so most of it, I'm going to say everything that I show is pretty much relevant to 9.1 or down. All right. Um, yeah, so um, I already introduced myself. I'm not going to go into that, but I'm better known with Cam as a community troll. So we, <laughs> we are on the Cycro Slack pretty much trolling here and there, but the reason for that is not to make fun of people. It's not to make you feel bad. It's We're really there to do that to make you laugh. Um, I studied psychology as well as computer science when I was in college, and uh, one of the things I remember taking away from the learning and memory course was if you can make somebody laugh while they're learning something, they're more likely to retain information. Moreover, if you can associate it with something they already know, like through an analogy or whatever, it helps them also retain that information. So that's why we do it. We want you to laugh, and it helps you remember stuff. By the way, give it back to us because we want you to do that. Anyways, let's think of the uto utopian dream when it comes to a forms or a form builder. One of the, and let's make pretend you're not a developer or, or an architect or something, and you want to log in a cycle and just build a form without having to ask a developer for help. Wouldn't that be the dream? <clears throat> well, well, we can't really say that was the dream of web forms for marketers. Uh, we have to start here because we have to know where we are today with experience forms. Well, web forms for marketers was the first thing that act as a form builder in Sitecore way back when. So I remember when this came out. I think it was version 6, um, 2009. And I remember I looked at this thing and I was afraid of it because I didn't I didn't believe that people could just build a form without a developer's help. I'm like, how is that even a thing? Um, I remember there weren't many features on it. <clears throat> it was just thing, and I'm like, all right, I'm not going to touch it. I eventually did start using it probably three or four years after it was released. Um, you had to install it as a separate module, so it was a Cycler package, and you had to follow some post-installation steps to get recaptured work and other things. But if you look at when it started all the way up to when it was supported MVC, we're, we're looking at a period of five years here. So maybe you know, almost five years. It came out, you know, it supported MVC on 7.2. Uh, that's a big period of time when people started using MVC pre-2014. Um, but within that five-year time span, I saw a lot of things added to WebForms marketers. Um, lots of things were introduced, uh, things such as, I mean, I can call this out on the top of my head, but they started using some magical configuration factory type dependency injection stuff that didn't exist before. There were a few other things. Um, but I remember even after 7.2, things started to change where first we got Razor Views in the file system. That was awesome. You could start changing things. But then they started getting baked into HTML helpers and you couldn't change markup. But anyways, I'm sure we've all used this. If you've been around the Cycro world for a while, I'm sure you've had your pain with it. But um, it was the module that kept on giving, so to say. <laughs> um, I would say most of my blog posts, out of any topic I've ever done was on web forms marketers. At least, I'm going to say 25 to 50 posts. I actually don't know. There are a lot. Um, and I had to customize it for particular reasons, you know, to build things for customers and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and just experimentations to see how I could make things work a little differently. But anyways, I'm sure you feel the same sentiment, but goodbye web forms marketers. You know, loved you a long time ago, but it's time to move forward to 2018. Um, we, and that's where we are now with experience forms. So this is not a module. This is a core feature of Sitecore 9 and up. So when you install Sitecore, you have it. It's right there. Um, it's 
built brand new. There's no web for some marketer stuff in it at all. It is its own thing. Um, if you're you still using web forms as a technology, well, you can't use this because it only supports MVC. It's built in MVC. It's pretty much using controller renderings and stuff like that. And um, you're you. I'm, I hate to keep saying this, but if you're still using web forms, you really got to get over to MVC right now. Um, it's not going to be around forever. I keep hearing Microsoft will sunset this. I don't know when. I've heard r different dates rumored between the next two years, maybe three years. I don't know, but I will say that you got to move forward. Uh, this has a modern drag and drop UI where you can drag things from a right panel over into a left pane, and you'll see a spinny and pop, you have a field right there. You can start changing things. By the way, this is within a form builder, and I'm going to show this, but uh, everything's so you it's not in the experience editor. I will get to that a little later as to why, but it, you'll have a form builder where you can do all this stuff. Um, Multi-page forms are supported in this. So what does that mean? So you can have a wizard form. You can have like five or 10 steps, how many steps you want, as long as you put it together. Um, also, that means you can have a confirmation page in line, but right on the same form without having to redirect to another page. You could do both actually in this module. Um, as I already mentioned, this part of Cycle when you install it, I will say the documentation on this is some of the best I've ever seen with Cycle. Period. Um, all of this is on Cycle.com. You do a search for experience forms, you'll find some stuff. You're going to find a lot of stuff. Um, I think I've seen examples of how to create a custom field, maybe two of them. I've seen examples in custom submit actions and other things. Even kind of uh, integrating this into marketing automation. Uh, there's a post out there on Cycro.com talking about that. Um, and the beauty, beauty of this thing is everything truly is an item. So on Web Forms Marketers, we had a magical parameters XML thing that you put in some parameters field somewhere. And then it would magically create this stuff for you for like, let's say, drop down lists and stuff like that. Uh, here, you don't have to No, It's not really like that, except for one place where we do have a parameters field, but it's in a different type of context here. And it has to do with submit actions, which I'll get to. Uh, and it's on XML, which is great. It's JSON. But really, everything is truly an item. Uh, you have things that are definition items for fields, and then you have uh, fields that inform items that represent your form. Uh, and I'm going to show all this. But um, don't worry. I'm going to give a real demo. I'm just showing the stuff I just talked about. But you have the right pane over on your right-hand side. If we look at this right part of the screen, you just drag it over to the left. Uh, and it pops right into this form builder, right in this pane. Um, the middle part, you know, I'm pointing, you can't see what I'm doing. But the middle part where it's all green is called a page. That's the, I would say, starting point for any form um, is you need a page, and that's where you drop controls onto it or fields. Um, if you look over on the left, you can see that we have a new forms route that's a sibling of the content node. Uh, all your forms will get saved there. Um, and then inside of there, you have something that represents a form. So, you know, for instance, if you look at the contact us thing here, you look over on the left, you have a demo form item in a page and it has fields in it and a submit button. Also, it could have other pages that one could be like a confirmation page or something like that. Likewise, we have a new uh, forms route under settings in system that has all the definition items. So you have stuff for fields submit actions and validations and things like that. We'll get to that. Uh, out of the box, we have analytics. So by the way, this is turned on by default when you create a form. So you can see things at the form level. So you can see how your, your form is performing and things like that. And then you can see how individual fields are performing. So if you have, let's say, I don't know, an email field and you have a certain label on it, maybe you're not getting a lot of engagement with it. Maybe it's time to change the label to get rid of the, form, the field altogether. So you can see all this stuff. And yes, you can shut this off if you don't want to see this stuff, but why would you do that? You want to see how your stuff's performing. <clears throat> um, all this stuff is stored in the new database in a very normalized structure with just two tables. Um, you can see we have something that saves the form submissions and then stuff that has field data for each form submission. Um, all of this is in SQL Server. So if we look back historically, 
you know, from web forms to marketers up until this today. We started off with SQL Server, then we went over to MongoDB, then we went over to both. You could choose one or the other. And then uh, web forms marketers went to SQL Server, and now we're still in SQL Server. So that's good news. Uh, the better news is if you don't want to use SQL Server for experienced forms, it has a form data provider that you can change and swap out. Um, and you can have that go to MongoDB or CouchDB or whatever DB or a flat text file, whatever you want. Um, if you put in a flat text file, you're kind of crazy, but you could do that if you want. Um, I actually have a blog post showing how to customize that. I will get to that in a couple slot in a few slides later, but uh, we'll just leave that as it is. All right. So when you go and you start working with this, by the way, there is a an article in psycho.com talking about this, but I want to call this out that you have to set up an inside out rendering. Uh, I think uh, it was Kern Hershkin that came up with this concept and he presented it at a user group in the UK. It's basically an inside out uh, rendering thing uh, it's for layouts. Um, the whole point is so that we can have certain timing of when your, let's say, uh, your controller renderings or other renderings are put into a placeholder and having some of these form helpers here, you see these HTML helpers here, these are for forms. It has to do with the timing of events here so that these HTML helpers can spit out their proper stuff. So uh, this one that renders the form styles will output you know, uh, styles that you associate with your form. And then there's another one for JavaScript files as well. You can have multiple of each separated by a pipe. I'll show where that lives on a form item, you know, a little bit later, but a little bit more in detail. I'm not going to talk about this because there is documentation that talks about this, but uh, you would set up your layout to look kind of like this in order to get it to work. This is a well-established MVC pattern that people are using today. Um, you need to have this to work, like set up like this, or your forms won't work properly using experience forms. I didn't do this. I didn't follow the instructions like I should have on Psycho.com, and my Ajax stuff wasn't working for it, which is all out of the box with this uh, feature. And uh, Cam Ruse is like, well, you didn't read the documentation, did you? And he pointed it out, and we, I fixed it. But yeah, I'm telling you now, follow the instructions, do it like this, or you know, it won't work for you. All right, so we're now back to having Razor views on the file system. So WebForms Marketers, I think it was in 7.2, gave us this ability, and then they took it away a little bit later on, and everything was baked into helpers. But now we have this. If you want, you can go in and start changing markup in these files. I recommend that you do not do that. And the reason for that is if Sitecore decides to change any of these in future versions and you do an upgrade, Either you're going to lose their changes because you did a build with your stuff in source control and it goes over into the website route, or you're going to have a merge nightmare if you're going to try to merge these together yourself. Uh, what you should do, and I'm hoping I can show an example of this, um, you would do a copy and paste and you would have the new, you would create a new definition item, maybe duplicate something like the section field here, which is just a div, by the way. You would just copy that, copy the, you know, copy the race view into a different location, copy the section definition item, which I'll show in the, in the content tree, or let's say settings tree in a minute. Um, and then you would just have it point to your race view and boom, you're done. You don't have to do anything else. That is a better way to handle these things and, as opposed to changing the markup in these files because you will have a problem. The other thing I love about this feature is that Virtually the entire thing is backed by a pipeline somewhere. So there is a processor for initializing it. I haven't looked at it myself. Not sure exactly what that processor does, but you know, if you do discover it, let me know. Write a blog post, send me an IM, whatever you want to do. Send me a text message, I don't care. I'm curious. Um, but uh, you, there is a pipeline to render a form, render all fields on your form, render a field for your form, get the model for your your, I would say your razor uh, view right here that I showed you. Uh, register your submit actions, which I haven't really looked into. Execute them, which I have looked into, and I'm gonna get into that in a second. And then one for submitting errors. The execute one is a very important one, and the reason why I'm gonna call this out is uh, it's something to keep an eye out on my blog if I ever get to it. 
Um, submit actions, which are like save actions and where for some marketers. Uh, virtually everything in this feature is in the Sitecore IOC container. Uh, submit actions are not. Um, they are created at the execute submit pipeline step. There's a processor in there that uses reflection or uses, I would say, a utility class to go create it and uses reflection to create it. Um, my last blog post, which is the longest blog post of all blog posts in the history of blog posts, if you ever go look at it, it's 103 C sharp files. I probably shouldn't have put them there, but they're there. It was to set it up to make uh, this support um, dependent, well, dependency injection for submit actions and other things in forms. Um, you basically have to create a pipeline processor for execute submit that would hook into that code I had, and it would go source it from the container. If it's not there, it'll create a user reflection and then serve it back to the caller. That was the whole point of my last blog post. By the way, in theory, that blog post would work for web forms marketers. Please don't do that. You need to move on to forms. Let's have a look at this and see what it looks like. All right. I want to see, can you guys see this? Yeah, the folder. You see a virtual machine? I see yep. it's core screen. Sidecore. You do see it. Good. Awesome. Yep. I, I had a problem with this on a uh, different yeah. presentation yeah. somewhere else. All right. So um, I want to, I guess I'll jump around. So here we're in the system settings and then there's forms. And under forms, we have all the definition items. So we have field types, and these are all the field types that come with forms out of the box, except I do have some custom ones here. The reason why I had to put custom ones within these folders is because this custom folder does not work. And I'll show you where this gets sourced from. But um, you can't, so with that in mind, that means you can't really follow like Helix principles with uh, you know feature foundation and project in here. It just won't work. Uh, that's an unfortunate reality. If you can get that to work, let me know. But I have not been able to sort it out myself. Um, basically, like I said, everything is an item. So we have an item here that represents a text field when it's probably not appropriately named because this is really just a label. Um, and a label that you can associate, let's say, different HTML tags for it to render out as that particular tag. But you can see everything is an item here and things like that. Um, don't worry, you don't have to go in and build things in order to, you know, I mean, there is a form builder, you know, and, and that's where all this stuff comes into play. But I just want to call out that everything is an item here, including uh, these guys here, which I'll show that in a minute, submit actions as well. Um, likewise, virtually everything is in the Cycler IOC container for this feature. Um, as you can see, there's 110 references here. Not all of them are out of the box. Some of the things I've added myself. But in theory, you can just go in here and swap out something using your own. You swap it out in the IOC container, and then you can magically change the way some of this works. Also, if you're not much of a IOC guy, which you really should be for an IOC person, uh, you can change things in config. You're probably going to have to do both. Um, some There are a lot of uh, pipelines and processors for this feature in here. And there are certain other things. As you can see, there are 255. Some of these are mine, but not all of them. I'm going to say maybe at most five or 10 are mine. So you can see a lot of stuff's in config for this. So you can go change it out in config. And boom, you can change the way this works. Or you know, maybe you don't like a certain part of the feature. You can change it. You, you have full control over this feature. Um, all right, so let's get to the good part. So we have, I want to go back a step. So from the, from the dashboard, or the launch pad, I should say, we have a new thing called forms. That's out of the box. Right when you install Cycle, you have it, no installing anything separate. Just click on it. You're going to get to a listing page where you'll see, well, if it's a new Cycle instance, you'll see nothing. Uh, but I have a bunch of forms in here. But let's create a form just to see what, how this thing looks. I'll let it LA UG. I create this. So that's doing a search, but if I'm just going to create a blank form, here we go. We have uh, things over in the right panel to drag their fields to drag across, um, and then we have a form builder in the middle. Or this entire thing's a form builder. This is just a pain to drop fields. Um, all of the out of the box ones have these uh, uh, special. You know, it's, it's sky blue. 
Um, custom ones I've added have these this red background, but just wanted to call it out. Um, we can just start dragging things. Okay, so this is a label per se, not really a text box. Um, hello. And then you can change the tag on this. By the way, you can add to this list. I'm gonna save that. And I kind of already showed you it's coming from this folder here. So if I added, I don't know, let's uh, probably want to duplicate something. Let's do marquee. Marquee, this is my favorite one. Boom, boom. And just leave it like that. And if I go back to the form builder, you have to reload, by the way, in here in order for things to show back up. So if I go back, I know I should have saved that form, but I have a marquee. Yay. Um, see if it actually works. I actually have not tried this part. But here we go. We have a marquee. Boom. Um, you can just start dragging things. You know, things are so easy. And you don't have to do anything in order. You can just click on things and start changing values. Uh, you can have placeholder placeholder text for text boxes and text areas and things like that. Um, default values. Um, you can even have, you know, validation. And you can add custom validators as well. Um, if you want to make something required, make it mandatory. And then you can add CSS classes for, you know, different parts of different fields. So, like, for things with labels, you can add a CSS class for the label or just for the text box or whatever the field is. They all have very similar things. Um, if you create a custom field and you want to add things over here, you need to know speak. Now, that means you have to have Cycler Rocks installed. Um, in theory, you don't have to do that. I recommend it that you do and you learn to speak because you can easily manipulate things in the core. I'm not going to say easily. You can manipulate things in the core database for custom fields to get things to show up over here. But I did that and it really wasn't fun. Um, I recommend you learn Cycler Speak and use Ro and learn rocks if you don't know those things. Anyways, enough of my uh, lecturing. Um, and then you can have a button. And, you know, this is a page here, and you can drag another page. This could be a confirmation page. This all could work in theory. Actually, not in theory. It actually does work. I've, I've had this work before. Um, and this could just be like thank you text, so stuff, stuff like that. Thanks. Um, if I do apply, keep in mind, this has not created anything inside of the forms tree yet. You have to click Save, or nothing will show up. Uh, the forms tree is this guy up here. That's where all these guys are. I'll even show you that. There is no LA UG thing yet because I haven't saved it. So let's save that and see what happens. LA UG. All right. And if I just do this guy, boom, here we go. We have an LA UG. This represents the form we just built. So we have our heading or marquee, I should say. Uh, so everything's driven by an item. This is exactly what I was talking about. Um, you can control everything in this in this form uh, tree if you wanted to, but it's this is really fun for you know a non technical person would find this a lot easier to deal with than having to create all these different things here and it's just a pain and but you could do that if you wanted to. You know everything is available here as insert options, but I highly don't recommend it. You'll be there all day. Um, but if you had to change things in here, you can. Uh, you, you have a lot of control over a lot of things here. Um, submit actions. So submit actions is something I want to talk about real quick. Um, these are like saved uh, actions and web forms marketers, but you have some things that come out of the box. Not all of these are out of the box. Um, you can I trigger a goal or you can a campaign activity or an outcome or other things. Some of these things I actually added. Uh, you can redirect to a page and save data. Um, you can see here I have an injectable save data. This is one that actually comes from the IOC container when I was experimenting with the last blog post, which will end up on my blog, talking about it further, and showing how to make this work in here, but I haven't gotten into it yet. Anyways, a lot of things are out of the box, including send an email campaign message. So this will tie in with the XM. Um, one thing that's missing is a simple SMTP send email. That's not available, and you have to create that yourself. There are blog posts out there, which I'll give a link to a little bit later on, but keep that in mind when you're 
uh, thinking about building something in this. You have to build that submit action to do a simple send an email. Or you can use the XM if you're using that. Everything's cool. Um, keep, oh, the other thing I want to call out with submit actions, and this is important, is when you're adding things, uh, the, the order actually matters. So if you want to have it go somewhere, I don't know, let's just have it go back to itself. Um, if I put this guy up like this and save it, and, my and let's say we have a form, we click the button, it's not going to save your data. As a matter of fact, it's going to redirect to the wherever where I just linked to, and that's it. It runs from top to bottom like a pipeline. Keep that in mind when you're creating these. The order does matter here. All right. So enough talking about this. Um, I do want to just kind of just go a little bit further in, talk about uh, I have not experimented with validators, but they look seem pretty easy to build. Um, I think there's just a base validation class, and I have a kind of like a slide talking about this, but I just want to call that out. Look at everything's here, and you just, well, there's only shared options, but you can do a duplicate, and you can just change it, and you can have it point to your own class. Um, we have all these just set up like that. Now, I do want to show something that's kind of more complicated. It's a lot more complicated than this form. Um, you can imagine it being a very crazy sign up form with lots of stuff. So we can see who, look at this, uh, you can see me hovering. There's stuff nested in stuff, nested in more stuff, and more stuff, and more stuff, and even more stuff. And then we have a confirmation, th thank you, success message on a second page. Um, so I had to actually build something like this before. And it was per some front end development markup I got. And I couldn't have it changed. It, I was stuck with it. Um, we had a field set with stuff inside of it. You know, field sets are pretty much common with forms. But I had a field set, and I'm trying to find it. Here we go, field set. So I had to build a field set container, which is just a custom field. Um, and it needed just to contain other things. And so I realized, hey, that's kind of like the section field. The section field is just a div. So if you go, well, let's go back. If, oh, sorry. If we uh, look at the section guy here, this is just a div. That's all this is. So I knew that worked that way. And I'm like, hey, I could just kind of copy and paste the section field and change it slightly um, and have it render a field set. That's exactly what I did. And I have that right here. So here's the section. All you have to do is just change this to a field set. You do a copy and paste for us, by the way, and move it outside of that, you know, uh, outside of here. So this is where all the out of the box ones live, right here under form builder template, field templates in your views folder of your website root for Sitecore. Um, copy and paste it, move it out, and then you can start changing it. That's exactly what I did here. I just copy and paste it, move it out, change this. I used everything else. Everything else was exactly the same. And then in Sitecore, I had to go into the field types. I did a, actually thought, yeah, field types and then structure. I, I just did a copy and paste a section. Ch just changed the location of this guy. And that was it. Done. Everything else was the same. Um, it's just pretty easy to create, you know, things similar to how they exist out of the box. Um, and then magically, I could just start dragging it in, and boom, I can start putting things inside of it. Likewise, I had to do the same thing for spans, because I have, so I have a span container, kind of like this. Well, actually, it is this. Um, same thing, model it after the section. Everything's exactly the same. Just changed it. Well, I copy and paste it, moved it out, changed the tag. And then I just went back into Sitecore. I did a, co a copy and paste job of section for span. And then I changed the location of the razor view. That's it, done. Now, those are two easy things you can do. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated when you have to do things a little special. And I'm not going to go too much into something I had to do, but let's uh, just point it out. This particular field here, it's... There is an email field out of the box with this, but I had to do special things with it. I had to add custom attributes and other things. That wasn't so easy. It wasn't 
virtually like a copy and paste job. Now it started off that way, but I had to do special validation uh, validation markup, which by the way, um, the email field doesn't use, uh, sure, it uses the validations that are here, you know, for email, but there's special things being done for the validation message to show up, which is this guy here. It's the prettiest form in the world. I don't have any cells in this. Um, but there's custom markup here to show, uh, to, ha to have it embedded in different things. So we, you know, we have a, we have a div with an SVG in it and other things. Um, I had to hijack the way some of this works um, in my own custom email field because uh, the experience forms was delegating off to uh, some of the Microsoft DLLs that do some of this stuff. And it wasn't very easy to customize. So I had to magically hijack it to get my own HTML in there. Uh, but keep that in mind if you have to change the markup of validation on some things here. Um, it might take a little bit. But, but yeah, you can see that this is the uh, prettiest form in the world. Um, it's this form that you see here. I'm not going to actually go into too much on this. We have an empty thing here. But um, we just have we have buttons and we have a second page that's just a success message and thank you and things like that. Um, so one thing I'm in I'm an experience editor, but I'm in preview mode. Um, the Ajax, so you can have your forms be Ajax enabled, and that's actually a checkbox at the form item level, which is this. You can turn that on and it will magically work in Ajax, but I haven't seen it work within the experience editor, even in preview mode. I don't know if that's something I did. I'm going to change something that broke something. But you can, you know, when you have it out published on your uh, site, it will be it will work with Ajax. And you don't have to do anything special. You don't have to write any JavaScript to call anything. There's a web API uh, call being made to forms that's out of the box and it does stuff for you. But that's how this would work if uh, I wasn't in here. Um, what else did I want to talk about real quick? Oh, you also can, let me see if I can put this up here. Um, you can, these checkboxes are here as well. Uh, so it's reading just from that form item. By the way, this is that performance and analytics stuff I was talking about. You can turn that off here. See, we created, uh, by default, when we, you create a form, it is checked. So you can uncheck it if you don't want to track anything. Um, what else? And you can see the performance stuff just by this performance tag on your form. Um, you can see it with different fields. Hey, it looks like I don't use this form. Um, but yeah, so that, that's just that in a nutshell. I mean, I could go into, you know, that special email field. Uh, the last time I tried to do that at a user group, not only did the audience get lost, but I got lost. I'm not going to even make that attempt this time. Um, all right, I want to kind of wrap it up a little bit because I think I'm probably running out of time myself. But um, what else did I want to call it real quick? So, oh, the, the HTML helpers I talked about originally. So there are the one that there, there was the call to render your scripts and one to render your styles. You would associate your scripts and your styles at the form level here, separated by pipes. And the same thing would happen in the styles field as well. Oh, by the way, your forms can act as templates, kind of like what web forms marketers used to do. You could specify a form as a template and it would do a copy and paste. It's the same sort of thing works here like that. Um, you can have a form be a template, but when you create a form based off of a template, it's going to do the exact same thing. It'll do a copy and paste job. So if you add a new field to your template, it won't propagate down to the ones that were created from that template. So keep that in mind when you're creating things that it won't magically work like a clone. Um, all right, let's go back to the slide deck real quick. Uh-oh. What? Live demo. Live demo. <laughs> oh, did you see that? Oh, you didn't see that? Yeah, there we go. Yep. <laughs> that's awesome. That's, Mar that's Martina, by the way. I know. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so I didn't really go too much into submit actions, but um, out of the box, if you're not using 
uh, IOC the way I'm doing it with this. Um, you would have to ha have your all your submit actions have to inherit from submit action base. The type that you passed into it, you see I have a string there. Uh, that's the type of a, uh, could be a POCO. And that POCO actually is a JSON object that you would associate. I, I'm going to jump back to the cycle real quick. Uh, that POCO would be something you would associate to your submit actions. Um, I actually didn't associate any here. If I go back to here, I just want to call this real quick. I'm not going to save that. If I go back to the LA SUG one. I'm just going to add a submit action real quick because I this is important because I don't know if there's documentation on this, but it's really important because I've uh, I've used this myself. So if I save to apply, save that, and I go back here, just reload this guy. Uh, it will create a folder with submit actions. This is how you submit actions get tied to button. There's a parameters field here. This is a JSON object. Uh, you would put a JSON object in here. It's a POCO that you would define yourself uh, that uh, the submit action base will hydrate into a POCO for you. And then that will end up in the type that's defined uh, right inside of string. See, it's not string, but whatever it is, whatever you define. So that's something you need to be aware of. And you, that's a good thing to target. Uh, certain fields if you want to grab data out of those fields. So let's say you have to send, I don't know, a credit card number. Let's say you created a credit number field, which doesn't exist in this, by the way. Um, let's say you created that, you want to send it to a payment gateway. Um, you could grab the form by form ID through, you know, having a POCO with those uh, GUIDs for the ID set on uh, your POCO that's created. Keep that in mind. Um, anyways, the, you can see that, you know, there is this method here, execute to override. I think there are other hooks on here as well, which I don't have defined here, but uh, definitely have a read of this blog post here. It talks about, uh, I guess, a custom submit action. There are others done by others in the community. I wish I had their links, but uh, just do a search for it. Uh, the community is really stepping up on this uh, feature and talking about it. Oh, the other thing I want to call out is, when you're getting a value out of a form field when you submit actions, you have to use uh, reflection. Um, it's a little kind of awkward. Uh, I mean, you don't have to use reflection, but uh, this is pretty much what people have been doing. Um, you can see I'm doing like a get type, get the property, get its value, you know, using reflection calls. Um, you could do a downcast, but you're going to be violating Liskov's substitution principle in solid. So keep that in mind too. Validation. So I have not created a custom validator myself, but they're pretty straightforward. And there's a blog post out here by somebody about this. Um, you just see this method here, validate. It's over. You can override it, and there's an initialized one. There could be hooks on it. I haven't really explored these myself, but they seem pretty straightforward. Um, I've seen a few blog posts on this. I don't have all the links, but I have this one in particular. So your homework assignments to so go home and read this, and then I want to report next week. Custom fields, well, I showed some simple ones, then I talked about a really complex one, and then I did present one at Sukhung Yu this year that was very complex, where I had to create custom property things in the right panel uh, that I should have used speak for, which I didn't do that. So it can get really complicated. It really depends on what you need to do. Um, there is documentation on this. I think there's more than just this. Uh, this particular one I'm linking to, uh, uh, works with the works with speak so it shows how to create a custom property uh, I would say I fit settings over in the right panel but definitely have a read of this because uh, you, you'll have to create custom fields in here no guarantee it now keep in mind this is 90 when 90 came out this feature which is version one on 91 now it's v2 they've added some other stuff on it that I'm going to talk about now but it's still not quite where it needs to be but Look at Webform's marketers. It came out in 2009, and now it's 2018. It, it took a while for it to get where it was. Um, I'll get I'll get to the Cycler 91 stuff in a minute. Um, encryption. So because uh, you know I wrote a blog post way back when of encrypting data in Webform's marketers. Um, Webform's marketers had a data provider that you could tap into and change. Well, so does this. This has an iForm data provider. Uh, that does live in the Cycler IOC, and you can change it. You can change it through this, you know, this 
uh, configuration element here, or you can change it to the configurator. It's up to you. Um, I wrote a post on Crypt and Data in this just for nostalgia reasons. Please don't code copy this code. It's not a strong encryption algorithm. And by the way, you can just encrypt things at the SQL Server level anyways now in 2016 by checking a checkbox. Uh, you wouldn't do this. Uh, I mean, you could, but why would you? Uh, the reason for this blog post was to talk about, hey, I can swap out the iForm data provider and have my data go wherever I want, or I can change it, decorate it, whatever I want to do with it. Uh, that was the point of the post, not to actually encrypt data. But if you wanted to have this go to MongoDB, you could. It's totally up to you. Uh, you if you're a fan of GDPR or if you're a fan of sensitive data, um, you can check this checkbox or uncheck it to turn off saving data into the forms database. Um, this is probably important for certain things such as, I don't know, credit card numbers, like I just talked about. Uh, you wouldn't want to save those yourself. You want to send them off to a payment gateway if you're not, let's say, if you're not using Commerce Server. Um, you would check that off, but keep in mind, if you're going to not save the data, you should probably do something with it in your submit action. Send it to the payment gateway. <coughs> because if you're not doing something with that form value, what's the point of having the field? <coughs> okay, what's missing in this? So there are fields missing in this versus web forms marketers. And one in particular is a social security number field, which I never understood. And also the credit card number field, which actually I have used in the past. I know it seemed a little weird. A lot of people didn't use it, but well, I encrypted data and where I used it. Uh, not credit card numbers. I wasn't saving those. I was sending them off to a payment gateway. You could do that here. Just create a credit card number field, and you can create a submit action that's sent to, like, let's say, authorize.net or something. So, but credit card number field is missing. <coughs> Rules engine support. Well, that's also missing. So that was on Webforce Marketers. Um, on Sitecore 9.1, they've introduced something called conditionals. It's not exactly the rules engine, but it's some kind of like conditional type way of doing similar things like the rules engine, but it's not as robust. <clears throat> I have a strike through here, but I have that strike through in quotes, I guess. But we also have submit actions that are missing. Uh, for instance, the send simple email is missing. Uh, the only thing out of the box with this is send an EXM message, but you can easily create one, and somebody in the community has. Um, uh, go have a look for those blog posts because they are out there, and I think there actually is a module on this that uh, adds uh, this submit action. <coughs> Multi-site support. So, <coughs> excuse me. So you, well, on 9.0, uh, you can't create, uh, you can't really, well, let me point out what I'm talking about. <coughs> and by the way, I'm, I'm under the weather a little bit. So um, if you go, let's go back to the content tree. So there's, you can't, you know, from the form builder, add forms in here for different tenants. Um, in 9.1, which I wish I had an instance in 9.1, um, you can select a folder to store your forms in, but it's not in 9.01 and 9.02. But you can't create the, I don't think you can create the folders from the form builder. You might be able to, but <coughs> um, but multi-site support is kind of there and kind of not now. It's not there in anything pre-9.1. Um, there is no workflow support. Uh, there wasn't any of that on Webforms Marketers either, but maybe that's something we want in the future. I don't know. Um, you might want to be able to like put your fields to workflow in case somebody changes the label and they, I don't know, misspell it and then they catch it and somebody else catches it. And also there's no event queue in this. So Webforms Marketers had one. This doesn't have one. Uh, maybe they will tie into something that AXM is using because it has its own. It would be nice to centralize this into one event queue of some sort, but right now there's nothing. All right, 9-1, I kind of already talked about the new conditionals. Uh, I, I do have a screenshot on that, but uh, there is a way to preform uh, form fields when you come into a, a page when you get on it for the first time. So there is a, it's like a data provider for, it's like a pre-filled data provider that you can, uh, cut, you can create one. 
and it will pre-populate your fields. Um, I haven't looked into this myself yet, but it seems promising, and, and maybe somebody will create one for query strings, and that'd be awesome. Uh, Multi-site support, well, I'm going to kind of say it's kind of there, kind of not. Uh, you can't create the tenant folders, like I said, from the form builder, but you can save uh, forms into those tenant folders when you create them in the form tree. And conditional logic. So this is what conditionals looks like. Um, and this is done at the form level. So when you're in the form builder, you can actually set all this stuff. And what it will do is you could say, hey, if this value is something in this drop list or whatever, I want you to enable this or disable that or hide this. <coughs> if you're hiding stuff, you can't hide a page. You can hide a section and you can hide other con uh, fields on, on the form, but nothing uh, at the page. You can't do a page. It just won't work. Um, I've seen this in action. I wish I had a 9-1 instance to show you, but, you know, it's not really the rules engine, but it's something. I don't know if you can customize the way this uh, operates, but, you know, that's definitely a f something for future blog posts for somebody. Maybe me. Maybe you. All right. So uh, the community has written a lot about this stuff. I mean, I've written a few blog posts on this myself of swapping things out. Honestly, you can probably swap everything out because everything's in the IOC or in config. Uh, Rodrigo Peplau, you know, in Brazil, he's an MVP there. He actually did write a send email action or, you know, send in a simple email. Have a read of his blog. Um, and then Bart Berndock, actually, he wrote it. I think this is a module on uh, GitHub. <coughs> he has all kinds of customizations for this, so hidden fields and other things, and including a, another send email action. And there are actually a lot more blog posts that I couldn't list on here because they wouldn't fit. But definitely just go have a read on the Cycler Slack. You know, we have a web forms hyphen forms uh, channel. That's actually a dual channel for both, for either web forms marketers or Cycler experience forms. So if you have questions, just go there and ask. People have been really helpful in there. A lot of people are experimenting with this, with this and using it. Oh. And if you want to migrate data from Webforms Marketers over to Forms, well, you can't. <coughs> and the reason why you can't is because they're two different things. It's kind of like if you want to put horseshoes on a car, you can't. Why would you? Uh, everything is brand new. So um, you could, I mean, in theory, you probably could build something yourself, but you're going to probably waste six to six months to a year trying to do it. Because you might have customizations that you're going to have to handle. You know, you're going to have to wedge it into a new data structure. I just think it's it's an opportunity for you to take a look back and say, okay, I didn't really build that the right way. I'm going to clean it up in this new version using experience forms. So do that. I think it's better. In your, let's face it. If you're building this for a customer or, or even if you work internally for a customer, you're building it for somebody. They're going to appreciate it if you build it again, and maybe you'll build it better this time. I don't know. Anyways. That's enough of me blabbering. Are there any questions? Let me check the socials. Um, but I do have a few questions. Let me see. Awesome. Uh, doo -doo -doo. <coughs> Man, no questions. Um, all right. Well, I'll be selfish then. Fine. Um, <laughs> I actually got a, I got a handful of them. Um, submit a actions. Uh, let's say one of the actions bombs. Would it bomb prevent? Oh, let me see if the camera catches up here. Ooh. Oh, do you want me to oh. go back to my screen? <laughs> Oh, no, 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 that's fine. Oh. Um, uh, so let's say if one of the, one of the initial actions bombs, does the whole pipeline bomb? Does it stop yeah. the other actions from executing? They, I believe they do. I think it, it just fails the entire thing. <sighs> yeah, I don't, because um, I've had that happen. I now I don't think there's documentation on this, but I think uh, when I was doing something, it didn't go to the next one after the custom one I was building. It blew up, and that was it. Damn. So yeah. I mean, there might be a way to customize it, though, that you could tap into it. Because uh, everything is customizable, but we have to customize it. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Sidecore, if you're listening, please don't let that prevent other actions. Please change that. Because we, we, um, we, we noticed a lot of that in, on the commerce side, 
too is uh, when you're in the pipeline, one of the come blocks, not processors on conversation side, but yeah. one one of the blocks blows up and <coughs> pipeline just exits, and sometimes it exits with an OK code, all kinds of things. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, now Ajax. So, I mean, let's take a minute and appreciate that a checkbox is all it takes. Right. To enable it. <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, and it, it is using the Microsoft Ajax libraries, right? The um, uh, I believe so. and jQuery. Yep, yep, it is. OK. So it's sending the markup back and forth, not yes. JSON. It's sending, the, it's, sending the, it's sending the markup. OK. That is another thing, Sitecore, if you're listening, please. That would be awesome if we could switch that to just JSON. Markup is heavy. Right. Um, then, all right. These are the most important questions: Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code for building this stuff, or you mean for me in, in general? In general, I use I use Visual Studio, man. I'm old school. Nice. I'm old. But I noticed you got code up like you were. Well, that, that I I use that just to present. Ah, I trying to be fancy. That's why yeah, I was like, I, I can't switch over to code just yet. I guess. No, I'm not. Use, I'm not using code for development. I'm just. I use it for presenting because I don't know. It was just like easier for me to spin up because I remember that instance of VS I had on here. It had resharper and things were slow, and I'd have to disable it. And, you know, I'm just like, I'll just spin this up. There you go. And then I won't get them confused because I don't want to accidentally show something I shouldn't show. That was the point of that. So I could tell by the color. Clever. <laughs> awesome. All right. And then the, this is the most important question. Do we have a king of memes title in the Psycho community yet? Uh, a king of memes. Or I an unofficial I, <laughs> I always thought it was Stephen Pope. I, but I thought I, so, but after seeing your deck, I don't know, man. I, 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 would, uh, I would argue. <laughs> I don't know. I think... Uh, I've seen you know, my previous decks. I mean, if you remember when I presented last year, I had a meme on every slide. Uh, this was pretty close. <laughs> this I, pretty I, think, I, think, I think we missed some slides. So Camus and Camus worked on this deck. So he and I pretty much have the same kind of, uh, I don't know, what would you call it, uh, way of doing things. And so like, we typically will have a, either a meme on every slide or almost a meme on every slide. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and uh, move on. Anything else, Mike? Any nah, I have nothing else. Uh, just have a happy holiday, everybody. And uh, it's been a great year. And get on Slack if you're not on Slack, and you know, definitely help out others in the community because uh, we can't move forward unless we help each other out. Exactly. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Good presentation. Right. I'm, right. I've been just uh, dabbling with forms. I haven't really gotten into the the deep nuts and bolts and and dimension injection yet with with the forms. But uh, I mean, it's definitely an improvement. God, it's uh, over yeah. the web forms. Jeez. It's, yeah. You know, it's it's getting there. I mean, it's going to take a little bit of time because it's brand new. But. Yep. Cool. Oh, uh, thank you. And we're moving on to Shrikanth. Uh, are you awake there, bud? You got your ears on? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> and thanks for uh, hanging, hanging out for a couple hours with us. Um, Not a problem. So, so Shrikanth is going to talk to us about Psycho Commerce Minions. Um, uh, like I was saying before, uh, they're very fun to talk about, especially with a client. Um, you definitely get a check out of it. So Shrikanth, go ahead and take it away. Sure. Hey, everyone. Uh, so this is Shrikanth Kondapalli, also known as SK. Uh, glad to be part of my first uh, presentation at the LA Sidecore user group conference. Uh, uh, so in today's topic, we'll be discussing about uh, the Sidecore commerce minions and how the one second let me start my screen share whoa uh are you guys able to see my deck yes okay perfect uh so 
I don't have much on the deck because I want to actually show you what is exactly it takes for a minion to run and manage orders. So before we get into the details, let's kind of cover the basics like. Uh, OK, this is these are the steps that we will be discussing today, like uh, what exactly is a minion when it comes to Sitecore Commerce? and uh, how we configure them and uh, since our topic or how to use the minion for today's topic would be to how we are managing it for orders so we have to go quickly kind of get an idea of how orders are managed in sitecore and how are we using minions and where is the connection for between them so minion is nothing but it's a terminology that given by sidecore but basically it's nothing but like uh, an asynchronous job that is running in the background from the minions environment in order to process any of the steps we need to we need to handle like for example when we think about the out of the box vanilla instance sidecore uh most of you who have worked on commerce, if you have played with the Habitat Commerce instance or the SXA storefront, which Vasily was showing in his uh, previous demo. So every time when an order gets submitted, you will notice that uh, when you switch over to the business tools in the Sitecore Commerce, every single order, the moment it is placed, it is in the pending state. And uh, if you come back in, in the next few minutes, you will notice that the status has been set to completed. So what exactly is happening in the background is uh, because Minion is the one which is processing the order and trying to set the order status to completed. So we will kind of take a quick dive, deep dive into how exactly they are set up and uh, let's kind of walk through the process. So in this, demo like I'm not actually going through a demo but I'll kind of show you what it takes to the setup the only reason being uh, if I start now just to go through a demo environment it will take a lot of time uh, so I'll kind of give you a basic idea of the setup and also the things which you need to keep in mind when you're working with the minions as I mentioned uh, minions are something that are a process which is running in the background. It is not something that's happening when a user is taking a or clicking a button on the website. So we need to be thorough enough when we are configuring Minion that uh, any time the operation, what the Minion is intended to do is running, we need to handle them gracefully so that the whole application or the order itself, in our case, uh, doesn't get any doesn't run into any issues or doesn't have any issues by completing the fulfillment so real quick as i mentioned like minion it's like an asynchronous job that runs in the background from the commerce minions environment now what exactly does it take in order to set that up so i know so for most of the folks if you guys are familiar with sitecore commerce you might be able to kind of get an idea of uh, when i'm showing at the code but uh, for others who are new to sitecore commerce and if you are planning to learn about it i would highly recommend uh, going through the sitecore youtube channel which is master sitecore which has plenty of videos describing on how to ramp up or how to get started with Sitecore Experience Commerce. So uh, so looking currently, uh, since this is my local development environment, uh, I will show you or I will show you the whole implementation has been done taking the authoring environment into consideration. But ideally, once for a production or a live system, this whole minion is be it will be set up for the minions environment. So if you notice here, the part which I'm highlighting on the screen, this is the way similar to how we set up a config in Sitecore for triggering a pipeline or a processor. It is kind of similar on how we 
define or configure a minion inside code commerce environment. So you can notice here that the type is nothing but uh, since this is a minion sitecore commerce automatically comes out of the box with a minion policy then the wake up interval wake up interval is something what we are saying is since this is kind of like a schedule job you are telling it how often or how frequently this job needs to run then list to watch i'll get to this in a minute uh, then fully qualified name it's again uh, similar to where exactly you have defined your minion or in other terms you can call it like a processor which gets triggered every time uh, this particular job gets triggered then how many items per batch and then uh, for each batch we are configuring it as saying that 10 orders should be going in but uh, between every batch uh, how many seconds or milliseconds that it needs to sleep for so in this particular example as i mentioned since we are using this minion to manage orders we have to start from the whole life cycle of the order so the user adds an item to the cart goes through the entire checkout flow places an order so that once the checkout flow is completed that's when the order cycle starts which is the initial state of any sitecore commerce order will be status as pending now since it is pending then why did i say that the list to watch is pending orders so the way sitecore actually filters out uh different types of orders is uh, based on order lists so i don't uh, if you guys can see my management studio here i kind of showed you a quick example of if you go to the order list and look for a list name called problem so it is listing us all the orders that ran into a problem so similar to this uh, if Sitecore has uh, a known orders list policy where you can see what are the different types of list names that Sitecore maintains. Like for example, when an order has been successfully completed, they go into the completed orders list, any order that has been canceled or any order that runs into a problem or orders that are put on hold. So in our case, uh, since the order lifecycle, the first status is pending, we set up the minions by saying that the list name it needs to be looking into would be the pending orders so going back to the code so once this is set up since you are handling or updating the environment json you need to of course do a bootstrap and once the bootstrap is done next time when you are the environment which you are working against once it gets initialized the minions automatically get started to work now what exactly is happening in this particular minion so let's take a quick look to see that so again for people who are new to commerce i definitely recommend watching the youtube channel for how to create the plugins or how to create the blocks as part of the Sitecore Commerce plugins. These are really important in order for you to understand and pro implement your own. So the moment the minion is triggered, the first thing it will get uh, accessing is this particular class in which there is a task in which we are saying that, okay, you have already configured your minion. And in this minion, you are saying that, okay, go and get me the list to watch. So it already knows that since you configured it, saying that I need to watch for the pending orders. So it will go to the database, look for all the orders that are in pending state and gets the list of all those orders. Now for each of them, if you notice here, so for each of them, we are trying to review the order and do the necessary operation, whatever we want to do. 
So out of the box functionality, even though the whole functionality exists in there, uh, it doesn't have any actual real case implementation. But uh, once when you consider an actual e-commerce platform, every order, whatever is getting placed, eventually they have to go through processes like uh, order fulfillment, where they have to send data to the ERP system or send data to a shipping provider uh, or get status updates, like whether an order has been shipped or an order has been delivered or an order has been canceled. So all these are happening after an order has been placed. So minions would be the right way to manage all these uh, operations. In our case, like uh, you can take this as a startup kind of an example, but uh, in our case, what we are taking is like, it's a POC of saying that I placed an order. Now I have to go send this order information to the ERP system fetch whatever the ERP system has to give back in the response, store it on the order, and move the order to completed state. If there is any issue during this entire process, just move it to problem state. So seems pretty straightforward, but as I mentioned, since this is a background process and you need to take into account like how many orders are getting placed, per minute on your environment and you need to handle them gracefully. Otherwise, uh, even though the order gets placed successfully on your website, they might never go through the fulfillment or there might be some issues delivering or reaching the customer. So this is pretty straightforward. What we are saying here is once it gets the list of all the orders, like similar to what you are seeing here, when we look at the order list, which is pending orders, it has the list of all the order entities. It grabs this list and then now we have to process each of this order. For that, what we did is uh, we created a pipeline of our own. So pipelines are, these are something similar to the pipelines in Sitecore world as well, where Sitecore pipeline can execute like multiple processors. Each processor does its own job and then moves over to the next processor. So you can say the commerce pipelines are kind of similar, but uh, here the commerce pipelines, instead of having processes, they have something called as blocks. So blocks are kind of similar to process where the moment a pipeline is triggered, the first block will take the uh, input argument, process it accordingly, and send over the resulting data to the next block in the pipeline. So I will go through the quick uh, intro of how exactly we need to set that up. But uh, as I was mentioning, so we created every time this minion runs, for each order, I'm saying that call this pipeline and process the order. So let's take a quick look into what exactly is happening inside this pipeline. So if I go to the configure site core of my particular project, I'm saying that I exceed pending orders minimum pipeline. This is the one when every time it is triggered, I need to validate the order. I need to validate the order from the ERP block, uh, then update the order based on the response we are getting from the ERP. And then if it is a success, then there is no point of keeping the order still in the pending state or pending list. So we need to remove the order from the pending list and then move it to the completed list. And uh, since all these changes, are done on the fly, eventually we have to persist the data or the changes that are being made to the order. So again, the scenario, as I mentioned in my example, I'm telling Sitecore to run my minion every one minute and it will go and execute that pipeline. 
So what exactly happens when the first one gets fired? The first one as in the first processor, or you can say the first block as part of the pipeline. So let's take a quick look. So each block kind of has a similar structure where you have a block and block will define like what is your input argument, what is your output, and what is the context. So this will be the same logic for any pipeline inside Core Commerce. So if you notice here, this input argument is nothing but that is what we are passing into the task. And this output, which is the order, is what the task returns as an output. And that order gets moved, uh, gets transferred to the next processor or the block, which is part of the pipeline. So real quick, as uh, we have to have some validations to make sure that uh, whatever is in the argument. So if we quickly take a look at this definition, all we are passing in is what's the order ID, which I have shown you in the database, uh, like for example, this one. And then what's the minions list? So we are just making sure that order ID is not null or empty, minions list is not null or empty. Then the first step of the process is uh, go and get the order. And uh, we have to handle every error gracefully because uh, if we don't do a null check for an order and we are just proceeding, if this particular block fails, uh, similar to the question what came up for the experience forms as well. If one block fails, all the consecutive blocks as part of the pipeline will never get executed. So there will be an issue with the minion. So the order might just jump into the problem status. And even though it's a good order, just because we didn't do a null check or we didn't catch an exception, the order never gets processed. So that's the reason for every single check, wherever you are depending on the status of a particular item, in our case, the order, make sure the order has the right information. If not, you can abort the pipeline. And then if you have to, like this is something uh, not available out of the box. I had to come up with this approach. The only reason being, uh, Every customer is different, so it all depends on the requirement of what's the volume of orders you are getting on a minute to minute. So if the volume of orders is a lot and you are, let's say you are processing like 10 orders per batch, so 10 orders per minute in our case, there might be cases where you might be getting delayed or there might be some additional logic where ERP system is uh, slow in sending us the response back. The second commerce minion with the same order can automatically get triggered in a new thread. And now you are processing two orders at the same time. So in order to avoid that, where I had some issues during with the concurrency. So what I had to do is for every order, whatever I'm trying to process, I want to set the order status from pending to processing so that even if a new minion gets uh, triggered and um, it's about to process the same order, I can make sure that, okay, this order is already in the processing state so I can ignore it and move on to the next order. So those are the things that uh, most everything are happening here so that uh, we can proceed on to the next blocks. And uh, the next particular scenario is Sitecore uh, all recommends or they have set up as their own implementation is every minion uh, whatever is running by default it has a delay policy so the delay policy by default is set to three minutes so if an order has been placed at this time and the minion got triggered it will check the order place date time and it will check when's the minion running 
if it is less than three minutes the order will be put on uh, the same list it will not execute it until that it passes the three minutes so that one is configurable it's always your call whatever we want to change it to like for example in my case i set it to 30 seconds since this is my local environment but in the production or in the higher environments it's always uh, configurable to set it to whatever seems feasible now if you notice here as i was mentioning every single block has uh, what's the input argument what's the output and what's the context if i go back to configure sidecore so once this was the block we were looking into earlier now the next block is the validate order from erp block so let's take a quick look into what exactly this one is expecting so if you notice here there is a change here instead of accepting a pending minion argument this one is accepting an order and it also returns an order the context will still be the same so once we take a look in this one so if you notice here every single block i'm trying to make sure that order is not null and a new additional check i added would be to make sure that order status is uh, processing if it is not processing then it is in another state which we don't care and we don't want to process that order anymore so always checking that if the order status is not processing just abort the pipeline and move on to the next order in the list and here will be the business logic which you want to have where you pass in the order to the ERP system and uh, check to make sure if an order is valid or not, or if the order information, anything you want to, there are multiple things that uh, ERP system holds, differs from customer to customer, but it's more like a sanity check to make sure that everything related to this order is good to go in the ERP system then going back to our next block in the pipeline is to update the order with the erp system now from here if you notice the pattern seems very straightforward where this one is again accepting an order returning an order and uh, we are doing a null check making sure the order is in the processing state and then this is the place we actually go and uh, retrieve the details of an order like for example what are the different types of items that are part of this order and what is the information that the erp system is requesting for so all that pieces can be handled here one second so right here so let's say like i worked on one of the scenario where even though the order has been placed successfully in sidecore we have to submit the entire order information to the customer or to the client's erp system where erp system kind of validates and makes sure that everything is good to go and it returns back with a order confirmation number and uh, that is a sign for us saying that everything is good to go with the order and the order has been fulfilled successfully so it's kind of it's one of the example but uh, again requirements can differ from each customer or each client so you can add that business logic here and then just for demonstration sake i kept like if contact component which is nothing but a component on the order which holds the customer information but ideally it can be anything based on your qualification condition i'm saying that uh, okay if i successfully got the order number let's say for example you are saying that go and get me what's the current transient membership component that's what the component is called uh, which says that this particular entity should be part of the pending list or part of the completed orders or part of the problem orders so ideal scenario of uh, moving an order from one state to an oh sorry one list to another list is to go through this process where 
go and get the component and make sure it is not null and then set the status of an order to complete it again these order status policy is something out of the box where you can see that these are the different types of uh, status that sitecore provides out of the box where the initial state is pending then it is released then it is completed on hold uh, if I have to explain on hold is the case where once an order has been successfully completed and then something has changed like let's take an example where a customer calls the customer care rep of the company and says that hey I accidentally ordered a wrong item instead I want this item so at this time the customer is going uh, the customer rep is going in and making changes to an order so that is the place where every time an order that has already been submitted to sitecore commerce has to be changed then you need to put a hold on that order that is when the order status changed to hold and allows the customer or allows the customer rep to make any changes and the moment the changes are done they need to release the hold which will put the order back in the pending which is the initial state so it's not in our topic of the day but i just wanted to give you a quick rundown and cancel the name says it all it's anytime an order gets cancelled it goes to the cancel state problem this is something for handling cases where something went wrong with the order and we cannot process it so that is similar to what we are doing in the example which i was showing so let's say the order number came back successfully from the erp system i am setting it to the completed state and i am moving the order to the completed orders list if not i am saying that go and uh, set the order to problem state and move it to the problem orders so we'll think that okay now everything has been done we are good to go but the only thing we need to keep in mind here is uh, every time when you are moving an order like in a, in this case from pending orders to completed orders or from pending orders list to problem orders you are just inserting a record into the new list but you are not removing the order from the pending orders list which is the initial list so if you don't remove it from there the next time the minion runs it will notice that oh i still have this order so let me go ahead and start the processing on it so in order to avoid that if you see the next block in our pipeline is to remove the order from the pending orders list so if you notice here so in the previous block there are only two things that happened as a result if it was a success you move it to the completed orders if it was a failure you move it to the problem orders irrespective uh, it can be either completed or processed so you will notice here that i added it like everything remains the same like null check for an order input as an order output as an order if you notice here i'm saying that if the order status is not completed or not problem then you need to abort the pipeline if it is then just go and remove the item from the mini pending orders list that way we don't have the same orders sitting in the pending orders list and as well as the completed orders list and the final step is to now that we had made so many changes by changing the status of an order moving the orders from one list to another list the last one is the persist order where we are telling that everything is good to go and you can persist this entries back to the database so this is a quick rundown i hope uh, i didn't go too fast or people who are new to commerce were able to grasp this uh, but uh, i think i'm good to go any questions
Let's check. Let's see. All right. Let's check the social. Ooh. Like on my camera <clears throat> adjusts to light, it makes me look like coming back from some parallel universe. All right. Um, that was a lot of information. That was, it's a lot of information, yes. <laughs> that was a lot of information. For people who aren't familiar with commerce, their eyes probably and ears started bleeding. I was like, man, I can imagine. But um, for, for the people that aren't uh, who are in the space, uh, this is very good information. Will you be, uh, I don't see any questions on, on social. Will you be posting um, everything that you showed us on, on the web somewhere for people to access? Yes. So <laughs> there is a blog post that has been uh, in works. So most likely by end of this week or next week, uh, you will be seeing a blog post, which I'll post it on social as well. Excellent. Um, what, uh, there is uh, there is one question I, I had in mind I was going to ask you. Um, oh, um, air, handling. Mm -hmm. air handling. So uh, since minions run in the background, it's very easy for them to air out, and uh, you will never know what happened, and they might even come back okay, but it, it actually blew up, something went wrong, uh, it didn't uh, properly return the code. Uh, I know there is an issue with Commerce Commander, mm -hmm. uh, right, that you guys had on the project. Uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about how you solved the problem, how you ensure you, you kind of got the errors to pop up and, you, uh, and not just silently die on you. Sure. So when you think like from the minion standpoint, right, it's not just the minions, but ideally any operation that's happening in commerce, it is actually going through a pipeline, as I mentioned. So pipeline, like a series of blocks, if we don't handle the error, uh, the obvious way is either to return a null or about the pipeline. So the main concern comes up is if there is a other pipeline which is waiting for a response from this active pipeline which we just aborted, it will never get kicked off. And because of that, we don't know what exactly went wrong. And we ran into this issue for one of our clients where we had to do was any time a particular order, for example, as I mentioned, if it runs into a state where we have to set the order to the problem state. Now, it's not necessary that the order had some issues and we had to set it to the problem state, but there are cases where something didn't work well, or let's say we are trying to submit the information to the ERP system and let's say the ERP system was down or something was slow, so it timed out. So it doesn't mean that there was an issue with the order. So what we did is anytime when we are setting an order to the problem state, we kind of created an email block in order to send it to the client directly, saying that, hey, this is the order that has been moved to the problem status. Could you look into what exact because we add all the error details in there. If they feel like everything is good to go, there was just a glitch. We have built a feature for them where they can uh, move the order back to the pending status. That way, the next time when the minion runs, it gets picked up again and the same logic will be retracked. Maybe by this time, uh, there might be no timeout issues or everything went well. But there are most of the cases is uh, they actually had some issue and they had to be set to problem state. But uh, as you mentioned, right, like uh, it's a background process. So if we don't handle the errors or exceptions, it is very easy to lose the state of the orders. Like uh, customers might every, everything went well, but the customer never receives their product. So we need to be really careful and uh, thorough in uh, handling the minions, especially for orders or actually any other thing, because we don't know what's happening in the background or we are not watching it constantly. Yeah, errors, uh, errors on e-com sites cost a lot more. Yes. <laughs> on the marketing side. <laughs> 
<laughs> so if you get uh, if you get to an implementation where you're getting uh, hundreds or thousands of orders per minute, you know, if you got a problem, that's going to back up real quick, and that's going to create a just a storm of problems. So proper air handling notifications is very 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 important with minions. Um, by the way, we also got to disable that default one, right? If we want to implement oh. our own, we got to disable the, the one out of the box because it'll just set them to complete. <laughs> that's that's true. Actually, I had that on my list, but accidentally it slipped my mind. Yes. So Sitecore Commerce out of the box comes with a minion that automatically sets the order status to initial status pending and moves it from pending to released and released to completed. But it's just plain operation so it is not going through any fulfillment or not sending data to the erp so my advice is if you really want to make use of a minion turn off the out of the box ones and create your own minion you can take that as a reference that way it is easy for you to handle it rather than changing the pipelines that are available out of the box and uh, easier for the upgrade in the future Excellent. All right. Uh, well, thanks, Shrikant. That was, that was great. I remember I was implementing my first order uh, export with minions, and I just like with a lot of things with commerce, um, you know, I had to do a lot of decompiling, trying to figure out how things work and how to, you know, proper statuses, what's, what's all out there, what, you know, you can and cannot do, what you should do. Uh, so this code will definitely save a lot of time to, for someone who's doing it for the first time. So this is, this is great. I'm, I'm, um, I was wondering what you were going to uh, talk about. This is a lot more than I, I, I thought. <laughs> this is awesome. This is really cool. Yeah. Actually, I had to cut through some of it because I wanted to actually run a live demo too, but uh, it will be too much for one session, to be honest, uh, it, because uh, I was kind of expecting people, there will, there will be people who don't know or don't understand sidecore commerce terminology so it will be like going off their head so exactly you know this is it, it's always like that the case with me especially or the case with our uh, symposium presentation you always want to show and talk you know about yeah. it you, you want to kind of share all the information that you you know with the community to make it easier yeah. for someone to kind of uh, do the same thing and uh, instead of uh, making the same mistakes and just follow your steps and you know um, uh, help the community out but it's you know then you end up just giving way too much where it just overwhelms people so that's, well, that's that's awesome I think this is great I'm looking forward to the code by the way guys we'll we'll post a link to all the repositories links to all the repos that we, we've talked about and all the all the code uh, and slide decks in the video comments on the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, I'll also do a post on CMS best practices. Uh, SK, you can also you can also probably blog about this, just uh, you know, reference the video. So uh, wherever this video will be referenced by the three of us, we'll make sure to post all the links that we um, about what we talked about. So, uh, so this was this was great. So we talked about the blockchain. Uh, we looked into Sitecore forms. I'm looking forward to actually working with those. I think we have a project coming up. Um, uh, looking forward to migrating away from uh, web forms for marketers, and uh, uh, a lot, a lot of good information on cyber commerce uh, order export. A lot of good code that I saw. By the way, that's that's uh, that's great. You guys really did your due diligence with all the status updates and list memberships and things like that. So it's it's very important. Um, awesome. So. Thanks uh, to everyone. Uh, looks like we got a couple of troopers still with us. Uh, if you're listening, thank you for st uh, sticking around. Uh, I know this was a long one. Uh, we ran for three hours. Man, uh, that's definitely a long one. I'll, I'll I'll make sure to post shortcuts to the sessions to um, to each presentation in the YouTube video, so you guys can skip right to it. So if you're interested in commerce, I'll post the link directly to uh, Shrikant, um presentation. And uh, as always, uh, uh, post and share and help out the community. Uh, we got Slack, uh, tons of uh, Slack uh, communication going on always. Uh, 
uh, Stack Exchange, uh, gosh, we got uh, Sitecore Community, uh, forums, online, Twitter, you know, blogging. Anyways, keep on contributing. Uh, if you guys have any questions uh, on anything that you really saw, reach out directly to us on any of those channels. Uh, ping us on social. We're always there on Twitter. Reach out to us directly um, uh, with uh, any questions or uh, or if you have an idea for a project uh, around anything that we talked about. Also, feel free to uh, ping us. I'm a person. I'm always happy to help uh, with uh, anything that I release out there, uh, or help you get on board or set up a blockchain. Anyways. Uh, so without further ado, we've taken enough of your time. Thanks uh, for watching, listening, wherever you are, whatever time of the day it is. Uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and uh, we'll see you guys in 2019. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.